Well, apparently you all just have me tonight because somebody decided to cancel the last minute and I'm not happy. Let me just be honest and frank with you guys. I'm not happy like at all. Like, please, any future guest watching this and I don't know, it depends on how this goes tonight. Uh, I might just delete this. I really don't know if we can have some people come on. I'm not prepared to do a show. I'm per well, I take it back. I'm prepared to do the show we were supposed to do, but somebody, our guest, Emily Curtis decides to cancel literally two hours before we go live. And so I last minute just received the email from Dale. Who's not here with me. Uh, we were going to do our, we weren't going to do anything. We were going to interview Emily Curtis on the topic of her book, on the topic of, sorry, I'm frustrated on the topic of practical Christianity, how to deal with mourning, how to deal with loss, how to deal with just negativity in general. And though that would be a perfect segue into exactly how I'm feeling now, because I'm feeling very negative about this, she would have been a great guest to interview even now. So here's the thing. I've got it set up for an open mic. If anybody wants to come on and chit chat, ask questions about orthodoxy, ask questions in general, you're more than welcome. The link is in the description or I'm sorry, the link. Let me post the link in the live chat here. And I don't know what to do. Like, I guess I really want to keep, I don't know what this is. What is this? It's a vape. I don't know. Anyway, it seems like a random and no, it's not a nicotine vape. I'm trying for those who don't know, I'm trying to quit vaping. This is a zero Nick vape to help me quit that. So no, no nicotine. Praise God. But I could really use some right now. If I'm being a hundred percent honest, I'm just laying my, my heart out on the table for you guys or who's ever watching. I don't even know, but I've tried to reach out to Dale via email to see what is going on. Haven't heard nothing back. Apparently Emily canceled because she's pregnant and not feeling well. I get it. Things happen y'all, but to cancel a couple hours or two, whatever it was before Jamie, I see in the queue, I'll bring you up here in just a second. Like I need some advice, I guess. So I'm going to pour my heart out to our audience for just a second to who's ever watching this. I just need advice on how to deal with these things just in general. I mean, it's been through my head because this is not, this has happened more than once. Obviously we've had shows prepped, i.e. interviews. I can't ask questions to myself. You see where I'm going with this? And so to take all that time to prep, to take all that time to prepare for a specific show, just to cancel the day of, and not only the day of, like maybe if this was canceled, like, you know, five hours, six hours, like that would be more understandable, but to cancel two hours beforehand. And then I not get an email or I not see an email. I don't know what time the email was sent. I not see an email like literally last minute. This is what happens. You get Tyler ranting to y'all instead of a professional interview done. And so I don't know what to do. Should we charge people that cancel? My wife said, no, that's probably not a good idea because then people wouldn't come on the show. I, how do you deal with this? Like if there's anybody watching that runs a channel and you deal with last minute things like this, like, how do you personally deal with it? Let me know in the comments, Jamie, I'll bring you up now. I'm just frustrated y'all. I'm just venting. But it seems like there needs to be something in play here to prevent or to, what's the word I'm looking for, to the opposite of condone canceling <laughs> two hours beforehand. I don't know. Jamie, what's up, brother? Oh, I, doing, I just man? realized I have to go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sounds about right. 
Sounds about right. Yeah, it sucks. It's a problem with the sort of thing online. You know, hopefully people try to be, uh, they're try to be um, faithful to their commitment. It's not like a whim or something, you know? Bro, I get it. Things happen. And, you know, barely Protestant, I explain it and reschedule. Right. I get that. But if you're a guest, this is nothing on you, right? This is everything on the host of the show. And so everybody expects Faith and Ultra to go live at 7 p.m., 7 at 5 p.m., right? We expect a show. We expect things to happen. And now it's just like, well, what do we do? Well, the only thing we can do is an open mic. You know, and if anybody has any questions or if anybody has anything like that, like, come on. But anyway, I, I don't know. I, I just need something to prevent this from happening. Or like I said, to not encourage it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to charge fees. I don't want to be that guy. I don't know. Get what, really, what, get more popular. And so people wouldn't miss it if their wife was having a baby and then have backups. Like if you drop out probably won't call on you again and have other people yeah. that are waiting in line to get on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Networks pre record, but on live on this sort of thing, I don't know if you've noticed, but everybody wants to watch live, right? Seems mm -hmm. like seems more like. inclined to anyway. Well, people feel, you know, for me, if I'm watching a live channel and the host actually interacts with me, that makes me feel I don't know. I get a dopamine rush from it, right? Like I yeah, feel absolutely. engaged with rather than watching someone's video. You know what I mean? Word. So anyway, but Jamie, I appreciate you. Let, let me just say this. I appreciate you becoming a member of the faith unaltered family. And so I'm just curious. I know you said before that you would, you would do that, that once you, you know, you got your money up that you would do that. Let me ask this, and maybe this could give some encouragement to people who are thinking about committing to the Faith Unaltered membership. It's two ninety nine a month, y'all. Like that's not that's not super expensive. That's the low tier. The high tier, you get a couple more things. You get like, which is four ninety nine a month. You get a recommend videos that just came out. You know, I just posted a video yesterday about that happening. About me thinking about doing that. I think that's what we're gonna do. Is if you're a clergy member for four ninety nine a month and you want to recommend videos, like we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Don't get me wrong. We get a lot, a lot of recommendations for videos that we sometimes put together. Sometimes we don't get a chance to, but for our members that are actually paying and, and supporting our channel financially, I really, if you guys recommend a video, I really want to make that happen. You know what I mean? So, so let me just ask you, Jamie, what was it about the memberships? What do you like about the memberships? What do you do don't like about the memberships? What can we change? But what made you want to subscribe to the, the membership forum platform? I don't know what you call it. I something. was going to post on my, my channel to encourage people to join your membership thing because, uh, just the way you guys operate, um, the way, uh, in fact, I will be doing that. I just haven't gotten around to it yet because I'm busy. But um, yeah, I'm going to post on there to get to, uh, tell people they should join because um, I just think the way you interact with your audience and how you have like a varying of views, but you have your own personal views, which you don't like hide. Right. And the conversation is open. I just I just like the way you guys operate. I always right. have from the first moment I came across your show. It's It's, it's how I would prefer to operate myself and it's not always easy depending on who you surround yourself with. Um, and so I just think that's healthy and it's entertaining. And and you guys talk about the topics I like, of course, too, but, but, um, yeah, that's like the low thing, right? The topics like you're right. And that's what I'm trying to get faith and altered to kind of separate themselves from everybody else. And father James, I see you in the quail, I'll bring you up in just a second, but that's what we're trying to do is really build a community of people that really interact. And so I see GU, or I'm sorry, the artist formerly known as a GU. So Savas, I don't know how to pronounce GU. GU was so much easier. And so you changing your name up on this, <laughs> it's thrown me off, but it's cool, bro. But thank you for becoming a member. Amber, so our moderator for the time being, she, I know you're going to go back to school, Amber. Um, 
she, our, our uh, moderator, she gave out five uh, gift and memberships on our last live stream. And so I appreciate that, Amber. Um, and, and I hope people will keep coming back this Saturday. Let me just make a quick announcement before I bring Father James up. Um, uh, G U says, sorry, bro. No, it's cool. It's cool. Just tell me how to pronounce it and I will, uh, I'll make it work. So, um, but this Saturday we're going to do a special members only live stream, uh, that I'm really excited about that. That one's planned. So it's not going to be like this per se, but that one's planned. We're going to do a specials member only live stream on Saturday. I think, what do you think, Jamie, would you rather have a live stream or would you rather have a video on the live streams? We can actually interact with people watching. Yeah. But since we don't have the 4,000 members, like I think there's eight now, uh, or no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Eight. I think, uh, with GU now becoming a member, what, what would you rather see a live stream, a video? What, what do you think? Well, if it's not, well, I'm doing church on Saturday. I would say, uh, as long as it's not during that time, I would, what I would time? Prefer the live stream. What well, time you go to church like, right now? It's four twenty for me. So any between 11 and, and, uh, one ish. Okay, so I'm but playing, I, and that's Eastern time. This is uh, Pacific time. Okay, I Idaho, but I'm barely in Pacific time. So we're planning on starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So perfect. that would work perfect then for you. Okay, cool. So I'm thinking about doing that then. Um, I'm going to guess the name is Savas. Savas. That's what I thought, but the double V is throwing me off, and I don't know how to enunciate the double V. But anyway, I'm glad you made Amber a. a me and Amber got gifted, uh, or we got bestowed uh, uh, wrenches on Trinity Radio this morning. <laughs> it was awesome. Nice. I really, like Amber. Been really a good person towards me and nice, and I appreciate input. So a Amber's awesome. Amber ran the training session for our mod moderator training so we are still looking for mods if anybody's interested in that gu's basically the only mod amber is helping out until september um just to kind of show people like what to do how to do it how to interact things like that she did a really good job on our last live stream and i'm going to use that as part two of our training videos um but but yeah if anybody's interested in becoming a, a moderator uh for the faith and altar channel um email me faith at gmail.com and I will send you out some videos. It's not a lot. Like Amber went into a lot of what they do on Idol Killer because she's the main moderator for Idol Killer. And so we're not there quite yet. Like they have a Discord, they have all the goodies. We're not quite there yet. All we're looking for at this point, I would love to build up to that. But what we're looking for at this point is just someone to moderate the chats whenever we go live streaming. And I know GU is a part of he's been a part of the faith and ultra family now for a while and he's really here on every live stream, but I would like to give him a break sometimes. Uh, but being the only mod, I mean, if he shows up, then that's great. If not, then we're out of a mod. You see what I'm saying? And so if anybody is interested in collaborating with him, moderating the chat, kicking people out, if they get rowdy, no, we don't want to do that, but we have to, sometimes we had to on the last live stream, uh, unfortunately, but anyway, I see BJ Allen in the, chat I think pursuit I have of a truth good feel for how you want to operate i mean i don't mind doing it i just okay. don't i'm i'm always like like i'm still feeling out how to operate from my position or what my beliefs are particular my particular beliefs are like as an right. Adventist. And right. so and like I, I try really hard on the more mature channels are the kind of channels i want to surround myself with the people like on your channel or right. idol killer or trinity radio those are the kind all sorts of different people of varying beliefs mm -hmm. and i want to respect their their position on their channel at the same time while not like being a total fraud for what I actually believe. And it's hard. It's a hard right. balance sometimes like for me. So I'm still learning, but you know, I, I, I think I'm mature enough to be able to avoid uh, and see the, too much of a fool myself on someone else's channel. That's well, and no, I think you're, you've done great so far. And so with that being said, yes, faith and altered. Now there are people who want me specifically to turn faith and altered into an Orthodox only channel, but that's not going to happen. And here's why. For anybody that has been a part of this community for any length of time, specifically when we first started uh, a couple years back, we've always been. So I started this channel as a Protestant with my buddy, right? So this isn't just my channel. This is my channel. This is David Russell's channel. We're the two main co-owners. This is Josh Davidson's channel. He's really the third wheel that kind of stepped in 
as we were still in development stage of what we was going to do with Faith Unaltered, he's Protestant, right? And then we brought Dane and Carrie on after we had already established the Faith Unaltered channel. And so really it's me, David, and Josh in no particular order there that really runs this thing. And to say, well, we're going to kick the other two owners out and we're just going to make this about Tyler. No, we're not going to do that. Now, what I would like to do, and this is what I've told people a few times, I would really like to get an Orthodox only segment. That would be fun. That would be something I, and I think the rest of the crew would be cool with, right? But to turn this into an Orthodox only channel, no, we want to expand. We want to build a community where we are united. Now I can see how people in cage stage form would say, well, only my crew is going to go to heaven or only my group is going to go to heaven. So why would you want everybody else on there? And it's like, I don't believe that personally. That's just my opinion. I don't believe that people might get mad whenever I say that. Um, but I don't, um, and, and we can get into that later if you want to, but, but the point I'm trying to make Jamie real quick, I'll turn it back over to you and then we'll bring father James on is that I really appreciate what others have to say. And I want to give them a platform. I will say all day long on what, like things that I know, cause I'm still learning as well, but things that I know conflict with orthodoxy because I'm an Orthodox Christian, I will say that straight up. But at the same time, I want to say, look, I don't know everything. And the more people I can bring on to challenge my views, that just cements truth in me all that much more, if that makes sense, right? This is what they did at the councils. They would bring two opposing sides together, debate the topic, and at the end of the day, the winner was known, right? And so I don't want to turn this into a complete debate channel at the same time, but I think people know what I'm trying to say at this point. So Jamie, back over to you. Bro, that's that's exactly what I would like too, like what I want on my channel, but it, it's so hard because my intention partly with my middle earth thing is because like I read, I read books and read papers and try to get informed with them. Um, somewhat you know with what scholarship says and with so I don't right. it sounds too stupid and so but i'm also not a scholar and so i feel like well maybe i can kind of bridge the gap here and there you know where i've read things or whatever and that was kind of my goal but like some people just don't want to go there i guess they want to stay in the mud or they want to yeah you know so i totally agree with anyways i agree with what you're saying that's what i want i want to be like not too um team oriented but in the same time i want to uphold sure. what i think is right and explore things because you learn something from everybody even the universe right. i've learned stuff from universalists and i just don't think that's right that's obviously wrong to me mm -hmm. um but yet they can point out really interesting things like you know how many times paul uses a certain term in certain contexts and then you could look at it for yourself they may be using yep. it or trying to trying to bolster some idea from it but the facts are the facts. <laughs> right. And I hear you. So it's funny you bring up universalism because I'm bringing Dr. David Ford. So we're not going to do a live stream. He preferred to do just a pre recorded video and then I'm going to upload it. Hopefully. So the interview is scheduled for Monday. Hopefully, I'm going to release that interview Tuesday if there's not too much editing that has to happen. I'm hoping it'll run just like a live stream. And as soon as we're done, I can upload it and it'd be cool. But if I mess up or, you know, if he messes up or whatever, we'll have to edit that stuff out. But I want to keep it as fresh, as organic as I possibly can and then upload it as soon as possible. But we're going to be talking about universalism. But you're right. Even though I personally do not like universalism, I love universalists just like I love everyone or try to as much as I can, right? As much as Paul says, St. Paul says, as it is, you know, to be at peace with everybody as it is to you, right? Like as you are able, be at peace with all people, right? And so with that being said, you're absolutely right, which is why I like talking to you as well, even coming from an Adventist background is because you all put different perspectives on things that I would never think of whenever I was a Calvinist. I was laser focused on soteriology and that was what I was good at, right? That was what, I don't know if good is the right word. That's what I was laser focused on. But then whenever I have Josh, who is by far not a Calvinist by any stretch of the imagination, coming to me and saying, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? 
Like I've said to him so many times, bro, I've never even thought of that before. It just opens your mind up. It expands your borders, right? It expands your map, as Josh likes to say, of what you know is here. And then talking to different people and just having a conversation with people, even if you disagree with them in the end, it kind of opens up your thinking to say, okay, I see how that can connect. Or now I see how that absolutely doesn't connect even more than what I did before. But anyway, uh, let's, so with that being said, let's bring Father James on, Barely Protestant. I'm very curious about this name and, uh, and, and see what, Father, you've got to say. Father James, how are you doing tonight, sir? Doing all right. How are you? Oh, is that for me? What's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you sound great on my end. Really? Okay. I, I hear this huge echoing and I, I'm afraid it's coming from mine. No. So if you go to settings, so I don't hear an echo, but if you go to settings below your screen, click audio. If you click echo cancellation or check it right there, do you see what I'm talking about? Um, oh, what happened? Okay. I see what happened. Okay. Awesome. Well, you might have a, if you have a YouTube, uh, well, five, no, no, no. It was, um, I accidentally had a video playing in the background and it was, I don't, yeah, it's a different video, not even anything related to this. Anyway. All right. Hi, right, hope you're doing well. <laughs> not bad. Not bad, sir. All right. Um, I just, I saw an invitation, so I figured I'd take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So father, so father James, barely Protestant. I've got to know, I, I've never met you before. So I've got to, how, where did the name come from? So how does that so, work? I grew up Baptist and, okay. uh, when I went to college, I started looking at different, uh, traditions, different denominations, et cetera. And, um, I was really interested in Eastern Orthodoxy, okay. but, um, I still maintained being Protestant at the time. And so my Eastern Orthodox friends would, uh, would like try to say, Hey, you're really Orthodox. Come on, become Eastern Orthodox. I said, no, yeah. I'm still Protestant. And then they would say, no, you're barely Protestant. And so yeah. that's where the name came from. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you are a priest in the Orthodox church. Uh, no, I'm, I'm a priest no. in within the Anglican tradition. I am, oh, okay. we, we would call ourselves a, a Catholic. I, I would call myself a Catholic priest in the, okay. uh, according to the whole of the whole sort of sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So you so, okay, that's interesting. So Eastern Orthodoxy, was that on your radar, I'm assuming, given the story you just told? So what was it about Anglicanism that specifically you was like, well, okay, I think I want to go be Anglican instead of going the Orthodox route? So uh, the a few different things. One of them okay. was the... Uh, I really didn't like what I saw as an anti-Westernism in a lot of Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm. And I am very much a Western Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Western theological tradition is important to me. Mm -hmm. I, um, I did not like the exclusivity. Now, if the exclusivity is true, then that, that is the case and I should submit to it. But I also didn't think it was true. Uh, the idea that everyone outside of the canonical uh, bounds of the Eastern Orthodox, as defined at the moment, uh, is uh, essentially damned. Um, and uh, yes, I heard all the caveats of, well, we know where the church is. We don't know where it isn't. But sure. that goes against the canons of, uh, of the Eastern Orthodox, uh, quite a few of them. And uh, just uh, all sorts of things like that. I still hold to justification by faith alone. I don't believe that uh, people should be forced to uh, venerate according to the Seventh Ecumenical Council uh, icons, things like that, even though I'm fine with a limited veneration of icons. So, okay. you know, all sorts of things like that. Oh, interesting. Because I was listening to Greg or Craig, excuse me, Craig Trulia. Trulia. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other Paul discussing the authenticity of the Dionysian corpus. And icons came up, and as I'm sure you all know, the other Paul is Anglican and would say that the Seventh Ecumenical Council is in line with some, at least some of what Anglicanism teaches as a whole. It's not, co it's not completely against the idea. There's some Anglicans who would adopt the Seventh Ecumenical Council. There's some that's not. Is there anything that you would like to add to that, or was he kind of mistaken about that? I, I love no. the other Paul. Don't get me wrong. 
but just you know you see what i'm trying to say no, no yeah, yeah i it part of it just depends on what is meant by this sort of um you know an anathema to those who refuse to venerate right right um i i, I don't think I, I think that if your conscience is seared by the idea of veneration of an icon mm -hmm. i don't think that you i don't think scripture then allows for you to um mm -hmm. and i do think that veneration uh can take uh too far uh can go too far in what i've seen within eastern orthodoxy so um yeah i agree with part of that last statement i haven't so just from a personal perspective i haven't seen icon veneration go too far yet within orthodoxy specifically but i have seen veneration go too far right mm -hmm. uh and and that would turn into i i guess it's a heart thing ultimately because mm -hmm. i know I, and I and I see John in the chat talking about how we worship dead bones and all these things like that. In yeah. my heart, I truly believe, and I guess you would have to look at it circumstance by circumstance, person by person, and what's in the heart. But I can confidently say within my heart, I know that there are things that I would do for, with, to God, right, that I would never do to a saint. Um, and, and so within my heart, within my head even, there's this separation, and it makes sense to me what Orthodox Christians say about there being a separation between uh, worship versus, so worship Latreia and veneration. Um, man, I forget the group. Julia and Hyperdulia. Julia, Julia and Hyperdulia, Hyper yeah. Yeah, yeah. Proskineo, that's, that's the Greek word I was oh. thinking of. Um, but you're right, Julia and Hyperdulia, and then uh, Latreia. So, so it just, the point I'm trying to make is it makes sense to me in my head, but you're right. I could see how someone could take that and kind of muddy the waters a little bit whenever it comes to veneration and worship. Mm. Can I ask a question about uh, that? Well, yeah. what, one more go thing ahead. though. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, brother. That was really important to me was uh, I, I am still convinced of justification by faith alone. And mm -hmm. uh, that was just another reason why I didn't become Eastern Orthodox. So. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. And now I want to touch back on that too. Go ahead, so, Jamie. <clears throat> I'm an Adventist. So I'm like a hardcore Protestant in the sense of like, although I, I really like Eastern Orthodox, I have so many agreements with Eastern Orthodox people. And I talk to them, I would just say yeah. um, uh, that um, the, like when I come across stuff where like, I see, uh, let me just be blunt, I guess, like St. Catherine's head in a box and like being venerated that just sim something feels wrong about that. I mm -hmm. guess like, like, um, it seems very, um, uh, something like God would have forbid the same God from the old Testament that is Jesus is. I just, that seems really strange to me because it seems like we're awaiting a restoration. And so to venerate the unchanged, you know, person's dead body seems like backwards to me. I don't know. I might, maybe you can change my mind a little bit or something, or I don't know how you feel about that sort of thing. But when you start looking at like, venerating some some you know it just seems macabre i guess like, to, be frank, to be frank i guess you know what i'm saying like what do, how do you look at that tyler or... i so i have not heard the story personally about someone venerating uh, you said and, and not to get too graphic here but someone's decapitated head is that yeah, fair saint saint catherine of siena i think the pope you know made her a saint i guess I can like pull up. She says, please do because I'm not familiar with this. So yeah, I she, don't one know. Of her, one of her claim, this is, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, she's a saint in the Orthodox church, but I know in the Catholic church, the Pope said she's a saint. So I don't know what that means for you or whatever, but I, she said something like she made, I mean, this is like a spiritual claim, but she said one thing she said, apparently um, that I read uh, was that she claimed that Jesus she married Jesus and her, his foreskin was her wedding ring on you know, literally yeah. on her hand. And it like that he gave her, he betrothed her with that and made it her wedding ring. Oh, hold on. Like, and, and who is this St. Catherine of where? I think it's St. Catherine of Siena. Siena. Okay. I'm looking at her right now. So I'll she was no fair enough. If that's true. So she is, and this is just Google. So, so bear with me. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but so Google says that she is an Italian mystic 
She was born March 25th in 1347. She died April 29th in 1380. Now, I just had Father Joseph Gleason on that was arguing for the schism of the church happening between 1054, that's the date that everybody gives, and possibly even there were some communities like Antioch, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, anybody that would know this in the chat, or Father, or Jamie, if you guys know, um, but in 1285, I think that's that's the other date that Father Joseph uh, gave. And so this seems to me, just personally, like this is a split issue, a schism issue, that I don't know of any Orthodox, and I could be wrong, but I don't know of any Orthodox Christians actually venerating like decapitated heads. But then it gets you into the question of, well, what's the difference between that and veneration of relics, right? Because we do have relics that we venerate. We do have, and, and for those who don't know, a relic is a piece of bone that is either in, that's either put into a icon. There are some that are put into altar tables. Uh, well, the altar, I guess, of the sanctuary. Um, so I, I don't know. That's a good question that I've never really thought of. But uh, Jamie, do you have confirmation of that is at uh, St. Catherine of Siena? And I'd love to hear Father James's uh, view on this as well. It, it's it's St. Catherine of Siena. But okay. <clears throat> um, the you're talking about this, the ring from the uh, foreskin, right? Yeah. Specifically? That was one thing um, she claimed. I don't know what to make of that exactly. How how literal she's trying to be with that, or what? How we should think of that? I just think it's kind of it's strange. That's but a strange claim. And just hearing she, this off the top, yeah. She claimed to be personally married to Christ. I I, I find a lot of weird things about her. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I was going to say, uh, probably the bigger sort of fault of the um, uh, divergence of from of east from west would be the the sacking of Constantinople in the 13th century, the very beginning of the 13th century. So that's probably more. Um, I, I, I did he say 1204 or so? Uh, your priest? I don't know if it was 1204. He so he's a so he used to live here. He's a priest in Russia now. He moved to Russia, <laughs> um, and I'm still in the states. So he's just a friend of mine that was introduced to me by one of the parish members. Uh, of our church. I love they got to death. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, I would, I'm going to ask my priest about this now, specifically, uh, father Daniel, uh, whenever I see him again, because this is an interesting conversation. And again, like I said, Jamie, I'm sorry. I don't have an answer. I've just never heard of St. Catherine of Siena before. And this might be why, um, she might not even be a, a saint. It in says her. 1381 is when she so she would have not been sainted instantly. So it would have been after 1381. Right. So this could be a Roman Catholic that. thing. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It's in the chat. Uh, some it just, and I don't mean to interrupt anybody, but it just seems strange to me to make the claim that you are personally married to Jesus, right? And I know in Western Christendom, that's a strange thing just in general. You have the Da Vinci Code, right? And we not we all know that's fake, obviously. But whenever people were hearing about this, that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, like there was an uproar, I think, between Protestants and Eastern Orthodox and even Roman Catholics and probably Anglicans as well. Like that's just something that seems very, very taboo to us. And for this person to make that claim and then to go even further and say that his foreskin is her wedding ring, that almost seems blasphemous. It just in my head, just on a surface level. Um, anyway, that that's just my thoughts on it. No, oh, yeah. Yeah. That just, it's concerning to me because, you know, I'm oriented. <clears throat> I want to see a unity. So I'd like to say Jesus is Yahweh, right? It's like, what does that mean? Does God just want us to affirm that proposition? Like what connection what what is exactly does that end up uh, saying? Like I'm not saying we're yeah. supposed to do sacrifices and follow the law of Moses, but right. but he is the same God, right? So like, how do we how do we want to how much do we want to depart from who God's revealed Himself to be in the Old Testament? Uh, I think that's a careful thing you have to do. I think I think often uh, evangelicals get it much worse <laughs> than um, than Catholics or Orthodox though or Anglicans. I think people have really departed that. So I'm not meaning right. to just beat up on, on, uh, anyone in particular. Right. Right. No, I hear you. And no, BJ, 
Dan Brown wasn't a real historian. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Go ahead, uh, Father. Do you have any any thoughts on this? Nope. Good to go. I'm I, right now. I, I'm kind of with you on this. Like I just I I hear this, and so the other thing that comes to mind is my so my patron saint back here behind me. You guys can see is Saint Polycarp, and I was reading in the news that apparently there is a relic of Saint Polycarp, and it's his arm, right? That the church i and, and and forgive me i don't know if it was i don't even know if there's a church in smyrna anymore um i would assume so i don't know if it's called the same thing but anyway long story short the arm of saint polycarp was in a church and i can get details on this here in a little bit uh whenever you guys start talking i can look it up if you want um but it was stolen and so i hear what you're saying jamie and i hear that right and is there a difference between a head and an arm in that scenario? I don't know. It again, it, feels, surface, it doesn't feel as bad uh, to me. But. Well, it doesn't feel as bad, but it seems arbitrary at that point, right? Because it's a body part. And so if we're going to be disgusted over one body part, yeah, decapitation seems a little bit more intense than amp, you know, um, uh, uh, Wow, I'm blanking. Sorry, yeah, guys. Throw, the, yeah, does that mean do it to someone's head? Whenever you face? cut your arm off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lot less disturbed by an arm, to be honest. But but yeah, that's a good point. And by the way, uh, Polycarp is probably my favorite church father, just, so, just for the record. <laughs> po no, Polycarp is mine, too, for sure. That's why I chose him as a patron saint. But at the same time, it's like, is there really a difference? I think that's a good question to ask to a priest. Um you know, if we're going to be, should, first of all, should we be disgusted at the thought of someone venerating a head? That seems very, mm -hmm. I don't know. But at the same time, if we are, then okay, what's the difference between an arm or a bone fragment? Or a lock of hair. Or a lock of hair, right. I, it just seems like it's a categorical difference to me to venerate an icon versus now we are venerating body parts of people i mean and i know we have relics. i say that as an orthodox christian who knows that we have relics we have relics in our church uh our my friends have relics in their icons like i get that okay and we know with the martyrdom of polycarp they gathered up polycarp's bones and they were thought now this is coming from the pagan source right <clears throat> but he thought that christians who gathered up polycarp's bones they thought that they were more valuable than gold, right? That's a direct quote from the martyrdom of Polycarp. And so how does this all tie in together? Maybe we should do a show on icon veneration again, but rather steer more toward the relics and the body parts, the bones, the heads, the arms, whatever, whatever's being venerated, and focus on that rather than the icons themselves the images so to say if that makes sense i don't know what do you guys think about that that'd be cool i like the story yep. of martyrdom polycarp's martyrdom i wanted to ask father james um because mm -hmm. I, I people i've had i i know some people that are anglican priests or mm -hmm. uh and they seems like some of them say they're calvinistic and some of them say they're not um what would you say like what's the so how does that soteriology of uh, the Anglican Church. It seems like there's both in the, in the tradition. Is that right? Yeah, but also the the quote Calvinism is within Anglicanism first is more is actually closer to what actually Calvin thought and believed, which mm -hmm. means that it's not as uh, extreme as what you get like not as tulipy, <laughs> not as tulipy. Um, I tell people I am not a Calvinist. I am an Anglo Catholic. I am far closer to the soteriology of John Calvin mm -hmm. than John MacArthur or James White um, or just about any sort of tulip reform Baptist kind of person you can think of. Um, Jacob Arminius is closer to Calvin's soteriology than any, any Calvinist you could talk about today, whether it be R.C. Sproul, Tim Keller, whoever, any of them. So like, it's just, it, it's, it's not a big debate within Anglicanism, the question of Calvinism, like people don't really, 
have those debates like they do in Baptist circles. It's not mm -hmm. a huge thing. That's interesting. I know that's going to, if there's any <clears throat> Calvinists watching this, I know they're about ready to pull their hair out right now. We do a lot of mm -hmm. Calvinist talks. Um, uh, so Josh, the guy that I mentioned earlier, him mm -hmm. and I both are ex-Calvinists. We came out of Calvinism specifically. Um, I would love to interview you now on the topic of that and what specifically you meant. I mean, not right now, but like in the future, mm. I would love to set that up later. Um, specifically, what exactly you mean that you're closer to Calvinism than, or what Calvin taught than what R.C. Sproul is, what these guys are. But I want to go back to something you said earlier, Father. Um, mm. You said that you still believe in justification by faith alone. What exactly mm. do you mean by faith? Like, could you define that for me real quick? So yeah, that's actually something that is uh, was a, an active de debate in the um, Reformation, mm -hmm. and part of this is what was what um, was a sort of an insurmountable thing at the time between the the Romanists and the Protestants. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold, in case you can't tell. Oh, fair enough. Um, I just got over the, hives the other day, so you're good. <laughs> no fun. Um, no. So the uh, faith. If faith is defined as mere intellectual assent, right, mm -hmm. then we do not believe in faith alone. It is a faith that is an active faith from which flows good works. We would just say that the works are not the, doing the heavy lifting of the justification. Okay. But there's still, it sounds like there's, n let me, I, I don't want to put words in your, out, your mouth, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But it uses so you said that it's not an intellectual assent, which I know and I've heard anyway. Now, whether they do this in practice or not, or if this just paid lip service to, so like R.C. Sproul would say the exact same thing, right? But at the same time, deny that works have anything to do with it. So, would it be fair to define this as like a faith? So, the Orthodox define this as a faith working through love. Now, there are the works do the heavy lifting, so to say, I believe within orthodoxy and i'm fine with that and so is there what's the nuance exactly between what rc sproul would say is that they don't they don't hold to the intellectual assent and what you're saying specifically or is there um, a nuance i'd have to look more okay. um so depends I, who you're I, arguing I, with <laughs> yeah i'm sorry right <laughs> um Actually, I'm not sure if the Eastern Orthodox <clears throat> have given a unified uh, definition of their understanding of justification. Okay. I do know that every single person I've spoken with who's Eastern Orthodox, um, with the maybe the possible exception of like Craig Trugley, I think, okay. uh, uh, talks about justification as justification by faith and works. So, mm -hmm. Right. And so Troy brings up, and I want to see where you stand on this. He said, so faithfulness versus intellectual assent, which obviously faithfulness would include works of faith, right? So there is still that faith slash works aspect in what Troy is saying. And I'm just trying to get the nuance between what you're saying and what like we would say specifically. Um, so <clears throat> the the idea of like you're justified by faithfulness, the problem with that is that still sounds like a faith that uh, is also being assisted by the works for that justification itself. Right. right. And, and it's a, it's quite the, the bit of nuance, but I think it is important still mm -hmm. that it is faith uh, that justifies, but, and not the works that accompany that faith. Right. Okay. But the, the faith itself that justifies it is the, um, but it is still a faith that just only a faith that will have works that that um, accompany it that justifies. So okay. uh, part of the way I think about this is sort of like a um, a relationship between a husband and wife, right? So mm -hmm. you love your wife and a true love for that wife will involve acts of love towards her, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you ever say that you have earned your like it, that you have uh, gotten your wife's love because mm -hmm. of these chores that you do for her, things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
well, that's not a healthy relationship. That's not how it should be. It, it's not like you should be coming home every day and she gives you a list of things and at, you know says, hey, did you do these things yet? Yeah. And then if you say yes, okay, well, I love you. Or, right. okay, I don't love you. I yeah. think what you was getting ready to say earlier is exactly, I think that's the word I would have used, is earn, mm -hmm. right? Because in mm -hmm. that scenario, what you're describing to me anyway, that exactly sounds like that, that you're earning that by doing those works okay now let's exchange i did the works now you give me the love is that fair yeah that and that would be wrong yeah absolutely i agree as, as an orthodox christian i agree 100 percent with that okay yeah. interesting okay all right cool so okay then jamie i'm just curious what you think about that while i kind of get my thoughts together here again everyone watching yeah. This is completely improv. <laughs> we didn't yeah. plan for this, all right? So I just want everybody coming in to know we had a interview scheduled uh, that was canceled last minute. And so what you are witnessing now is totally off the top of all of our heads. Um, okay. So give me a little bit to think about this, and then I'll get back with you. But, Jamie, go ahead, brother. Yeah, I tend to agree with uh, what uh, what was said here. I think uh, yeah. justification by faith is true. I'm a Protestant. I'm a Wesleyan. Uh, my tradition comes out of Wesley's thinking, I think holiness movement sort of thing. But I would say, yeah, uh, it is through what Christ did that justifies you before God. And it seems like Paul's clear that nothing you do can make you right before God. And it, so you're, you're kind of, you're kind of recognizing what, you know, Christ did is what makes you right before God. It's not that now, then after that, you have to earn it. But I think mm -hmm. it seems pretty clear to me that if you don't, I mean, Jesus said, if you don't abide, mm -hmm. which means remain and stay, Paul echoes that in first Corinthians 15, one through three, it's all right. over the new Testament. second Peter two, you know, Hebrews six. It's like, you must stay connected to Jesus, but you get in just as so I would say through repentance on your deathbed, uh, people can probably get into heaven that way. Let's say, uh, because of what Christ has done. But like, if you think you just have to say the word honk for Jesus and now you're in, no matter what, that's what I'm against. I, free, that free grace stuff is, is just poison. So would it be fair, Jamie, then to say like prayer, prayer, now you're saved. That's kind of like honking for Jesus in what you're describing. Because right. that's the way I would take that coming from an IFB background. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't mean that he doesn't start with a honk for Jesus. If you agreed. Will. Agreed. So that that is the first step, but to think that that's all is related is is uh is, uh, is really ridiculous. To mm -hmm. be honest, that's mm -hmm. my view. <laughs> sure, sure, Father uh, James, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I was looking before at the uh, I'm multitasking while talking here. Um, yeah. I was uh, uh, where is it? Someone is asking about James too. It looks yeah, like yeah, that's yep, yep, that's yeah. where I was going to go so, next. <clears throat> One of the things that's important to note with uh, James 2 is that we're, um, we're looking at this idea of that question of like, are we talking about faith as a mere intellectual ascent? And I think that's much more of what uh, James is, is getting in, in line with, with understanding, um, right. because he points out like even the demons believe, right? You know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not that James and, and Paul contradict each other. Right. It is that they're they're not answering the exact same question using the exact same terminology in the exact same way. Um, just justification just means you know being made right, right, or or or, or, or declared right, or, or or that there's a that there's a rightness being had. Mm -hmm. So yeah, right on, right on, and and so we just had a conversation with Father John Whiteford and the guys from Method Ministries about this topic and i've heard many many different protestants say many different things two main things whenever it comes to james and i'm just curious where you stand on this father that james is only speaking the main one i hear is that james is only speaking of justification in the sight of men and we've gotten a few people including the guys from method ministries i'm not sure if you're familiar with those guys or not um no. But they would, they admitted during the debate, no, it's not just in the sight of men, it's actually in the sight of God as well. There's some sense in which God justifies us by our works, but it's not that initial justification, it's the vindication, right? And what the nuance there between those guys, you'd have to ask them. I'm still not clear on that, but it almost sounds like what they're saying, and this is what I said in my review of that video, 
that it almost sounds like they're treating justification as like a two-way street. There's this initial justification, and there's a different justification that happens later on down the road whenever you actually start doing these works, since they both come from God. And I'm just like, well, why don't you just say it's one type of justification that includes faith and works? It just seems like they're splitting hairs at this point, or maybe I'm splitting hairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, really quick, just to be clear, sure. one of them was a Wesleyan yeah. Methodist, and the other one was a Presbyterian, technically. Right. So they didn't right. actually fully agree on exactly how that operates, just wanted to point that out. Right, and fair enough, Jamie. Thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're looking at... Um, I think what we're dealing with is just two perspectives uh, mm -hmm. from, you know, from St. James versus, you know, from St. Paul and mm -hmm. not that they contradict each other, but that they're just looking at the same thing from two different angles. Yeah. Yeah. So I think or, good. Good. All right. Yeah. So St. Paul, when he's thinking of faith, he is thinking of the active faith, the only really like a true faith, like a, an actual faith kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, well, that's all that's necessary. And St. James is saying, well, he's probably thinking more on the along the lines of, well, a faith, but uh, attributing more of a mere intellectual sense. Well, mm -hmm. what what is uh, what is the difference between that mere intellectual sense in an active faith? Well, you'll see fruit of that active faith by works, right? Right. And so, in that sense, we could probably talk about justification by faith and works. In that sense, I think this is, gets uh, uh, goes back and forth with. The Reformation itself, uh, because these are sort of the distinctions that are made uh, on each side in the Reformation. Um, and so for me, I I say, if that's all that's being like sort of worked out, that's fine. Yeah. But I think both James and Paul would agree that the work itself is not doing the heavy lifting of the justification. Now we could disagree on that or whatever, but I, I think that that is still the case because I think it's so clear in St. Paul <clears throat> that the work itself does not justify you that um, he uh, agreed. Go, go, go. No, I, I was going to say, I agree a hundred percent with what you just said. The work itself does not justify you. Absolutely. 100% mm -hmm. with that. However, so, and I think that's the difference between, so if we go back to the New Testament, right, the Pharisees were trying to work their way to heaven by obeying the law. Jesus was completely out of that picture, right? That's never going to be good enough for them because Jesus said, if you, to honor the Father is to honor the Son, right? Mm -hmm. And so because that faith in Christ, the God-man who was present with them at that time, they can't say they have faith in God if God is standing right in front of them and they're saying he's a blasphemer, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the distinction maybe that Paul and James are the same thing, what you're saying that they're talking about, because I agree with a lot of what you just said, Father, that the initial faith is what justifies a person, right? Now, in general terms, that faith, and granted, there's always exceptions to rules, right? Deathbed confessions, thief on the cross, even though I would say he did works by confessing, right? Repenting, those things are works in my eyes. But, 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 in general, yes, the faith that saves you is a faith that leads, that, that I think begins with love, right? And will lead to those good works, always if it doesn't then those that faith is dead in james's eyes in my opinion it, it, would you agree with that or am yeah, i missing it, the mark somewhere I, I think that makes sense yeah so if okay. um if uh, the faith doesn't have works accompanying it it is dead it is right but the works themselves are not the thing that are doing the saving right right interesting interesting Tyler, can, this goes right along with what you're saying it's yeah. just two just two scriptures from paul here next to each other i put on a slide but it, okay, yeah, I'll yeah. show I'll, I'll throw that up. Yep. <clears throat> both Paul, both early writings of Paul in a context where he's saying circumcision isn't what's important. Mm -hmm. Uh I think the Greek in the second one you could say, but is what so he's contrasting the two. What matters mm -hmm. is keeping the commandments of God, but it's mm -hmm. also this is a similar thing in faith working through love. He also says in Galatians 6 5, he reiterates it and he says the new creation rather than faith working through love. And so 
to me that that helps clarify it. faith working through love is an obedient well uh, allegiance with that second one is it not yeah go ahead <clears throat> well with that that second one i'd like to look at the context a little bit more so give me a second but um i wouldn't say that it's the keeping of the commandments of god that save you because that no man can keep the commandments of god that goes back to saint paul himself of course um first corinthians 7 19 first corinthians let's see yeah yeah it, was, it seems like what are the commandments he's talking about is one question is he's not talking about keeping the mosaic covenant obviously um but would he would he say that I mean, in the same context what is faith working through love exactly so um well, for, first, just to make a clarification with 1 Corinthians 7, 19, uh, in the question of justification by faith alone, and this happens with a lot, not that you guys are necessarily doing this, but sometimes this happens with people, is that there's this idea of a conflation between antinomianism and uh, justification by faith alone. They are not the same thing. Antinomianism is the belief that, well, the law doesn't matter at all, uh, good works don't matter at all, because we are justified by faith alone. And... Uh, so therefore, no good works are necessary for anything, and we don't even really need to worry about keeping the law. Mm -hmm. Whereas the law is still very important in the Christian faith for those of us who believe in justification by faith alone. Um, uh, the the true faith is the faith that is working through love. So that's what I guess I would say. Yeah. Jamie, is there any follow up there? Or? Yeah, I would just. I'm curious what what how you would tend for me. Uh, neither of these statements are about being justified, uh, right. the justification part. But I would say it seems like faith working through love must be related to, you know, I would say the keeping of the commandments so, are reflecting the image of God as exemplified in Jesus' life. I So to that point, I think Jesus laid down what love is, right? So first of all, Jesus specifically said that there's no greater love than a person lay down his life for his friends, right? That's first and foremost. Now, that's the greatest kind of love. Are we expected to do that on a daily basis? I think if the time comes and the and the time calls for it, absolutely. But most of us don't get that opportunity. So I'm going to do what I did before and go back to speaking in generalization terms. I think for most people who are truly born again, right? Now, we're excluding deathbed confessions. We are excluding maybe even infants that are indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the womb, like John the Baptist, for example. Um, but generally speaking, right, and Dell and I have had this conversation a lot, that if you're truly born again, you are going to do the works and the good works that God has predestined, as Ephesians says, before the foundation of the world, right? He predestined you to walk in these things. These are the things that you're going to walk into without determinism, obviously, but the point is, is that in a general way, in speaking generally, I can't say that enough, and I want to emphasize that more than anything in this conversation, that if you're truly born again, you are going to treat others as you would like yourself to be treated. Jesus said, this is the golden rule. I truly believe what love encapsulates is that very thing. Treat others how you want to be treated. If you're doing that, you're truly loving your neighbor. I think it's okay. simple to me. That's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to, just for fun, this is a perfect setup yeah. for me. And I, then I'll I bring Jordan in on this here in just a second. This, yeah, go ahead. This, I want to, so I'm going to challenge you guys. And for yeah. you get it, awesome. Uh, I respect both of you. I don't mean to, in no way am I trying to talk down, but yeah, no, you're good. Me so deeply today. Okay. So that's one of my favorite verses. There's no yeah. greater thing a man can do than to lay down his life for his friends. Do either of you remember what the next verse says? Off the top, no. no. You are my friends if you do whatever so I Whatever I tell you. you, yeah. And I read that the other day, a few months ago, and I was like, I love this verse, and I, how should I take that? That's very, it was very mm. striking to me. And and um, look, I'm not saying you have to earn your salvation, but I was just like, wow, he says that. Because I would look at that as like, that's what Jesus did. He right. laid down his life for sinners. Well, they, we were yet sinners. Christ died for our sins, right? Right. And that's very powerful and the fact that he says that too is like it's kind of strikes my soul anyway mm -hmm. no you're right and i need to and thank you for pointing that out jamie so i need to incorporate that 
aspect into my proof texting uh, whenever I talk about that subject. So I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Jordan, let's bring you up, brother. And let's see, because I know you said you want to talk about this. So, Jordan, yeah. what is going on? So, um, yeah, th I think this is. I I just popped on, but I, I, I think yeah. I get the understanding of what you guys are talking about. This is one of my favorite subjects, really. Just I think a lot of people in in the church, I mean, even Orthodox, even Orthodox too, sometimes have this have an have a false dichotomy between like faith and works, or or even the law and grace, or or um you know doing keeping the commandments like obeying christ obedience and then also grace and and the free gift of god and so i think but i think what people fail to realize is that the ability or not just the ability but um the joy and the life that comes when you obey obey, <laughs> obey Christ and keep his commandments mm -hmm. and do good works and and do all these works when it's when it's works of God it's it's because it's the work of God in in you and it's because of the free gift of of salvation that's working in and through you that is bringing that joy in that life and so that's why i mean why paul talks so much so much in romans and and galatians even some in ephesians about people trying to earn their way to heaven through keeping the law keep keeping the works of the law the, the and basically a lot of people also somewhat misunderstand what works the law means too and it's specifically the sacrificial system in the in the um, ceremonial laws undergirding those things um and and they think that okay oh since paul is saying that this is bringing death because they're trying to keep the law that therefore now keeping the law or or even obeying christ at all or doing this or that or keeping tradition or whatever you want to put that um whatever they want to say they say oh that's now bringing death no matter what but that's not what he's saying because he says in 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 Romans 8 the spirit of the law of the spirit of life so mm -hmm. even he has different meanings of law and people miss that and you have to really pay attention to what that means and through each and every time he says law um because nomos just means a way of doing something like a the way it, it could be it could be the law of moses it could be the law of sin and death it could be the law written on the heart it could be you know it you have to be pay attention but yeah i think people miss that actually keeping god's commandments when you're doing it out of love for christ like like jamie pointed out my friends are those who do what i command you and laying down your own life and for your friend is love and and in that verse for in christ jesus neither circumcision nor circumcision avails anything but faith working through love that that undergirding love of god in us through my Holy Spirit and uh, our keep um, the righteous commands of God, his his to become like him, to become because his his heart is who he is, is is in Christ and who he is through him through him. That's he showed his how to keep the law. Through Christ, He showed how to to obey Him through Christ, and so. Right. Anyways, it's really the by following Christ in in the Spirit, obedience actually brings life. Now, but but then again, even it even if you have the Spirit, you can still fall into the um. 
the the danger of legalism still because now you can say oh you know i'm doing this myself all on my own or i'm i'm working this out because i'm earning it or because this or you make you can or checklist off of a box you know different ways you can come up with being legalistic still in the faith yeah um but yeah no, I like, I like that, Jordan. And and let me, so the thing that's stuck in my mind while you were talking just now is that if you are doing works, and Father James, I know you have to go, so I'm going to hand this over to you right after this. But just the thing that stuck in my mind was if you're doing works to earn your way into heaven, like there's some kind of checklist, okay, did I do enough of this today? All right, I did check. Did I do enough of this? Eh, I think I failed there. You're starting from a wrong place to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. you, yes. The Holy Spirit indwelling you is to, in my opinion, to energize. Let's use the biblical terminology. To energize yeah. you to do works out of a heart of love, not out of a heart of, I want to earn something. And I think that's what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter four, uh, or chapter four and five specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, but Father James, I know you got to run. Let me turn it over to you real quick to get your final thoughts on that. And then if you've got to go, feel free to drop out. I see my co-host Dell has finally showed up. No, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Dell, I'm just messing with you. I know you got that probably late. But Father James, go ahead, and then uh, Jordan, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, I I just think that um, God is. Um, uh, the one who is uh, saving us and uh, that includes transformation. So it's not a sort of mere imputation. Uh, it is something that actually does change us uh, ontologically. We're made new creatures. Right. Um, uh -huh. But also we, we deal with the reality of, of sin in our lives. We deal with failing God every day and we are called daily to repentance in that. And we are called to uh, continue to remain in him. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that if we look at that and if we also look at um, God as actually desiring our salvation mm -hmm. and not looking for reasons to damn us, uh, but actually uh, 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 bringing us into that relationship with him, um, I think that we can understand that while, yes, faith, uh, that, you know, while uh, we are not supposed to just sort of continue in sin that grace may abound, uh, mm -hmm. we are actually called uh, to uh, just submit to him in faith. And because of that faith, we'll be able to uh, be equipped to do the things of God. So, yeah. Right on, right on. I appreciate you stopping by, Father James. And again, I would love to have you back on in the future to discuss Calvinism from a Anglican perspective. And so thank you for swinging by. I really appreciate you. All right, peace. See ya. All right, we've got a full house now, guys. So this yeah. started off as just me ranting, and now here's Dell, here's Troy, Priscilla, Jamie, Jordan. Guys, what is going on, Dell? I'm going to turn it over to you. Brother, what happened with Emily, man? Like, I've already gave the spiel, so you ain't got to go into crazy detail, but has she messaged back? Like, what happened there? Yeah, so so the, basically, literally like two hours beforehand or something like that. So, okay, so a week and a half ago, I got an email. We had the show set up for maybe like what two months now, Tyler. Yeah. So up for this day. It's been a long time. Yeah, and so a week and a half ago, I got an email saying like, "Oh, hey, can we can we reschedule for next week?" Kind of thing uh, for the sixteenth because I want to go on vacation. I'm just like, well, I can't. I need to talk to Tyler first. I, I'm not going to just reschedule like that. And we also have a show already for next week with Keith Augustine and, and everything on NDEs. So I checked with Tyler, he said, no. So I went uh, back and emailed and said, no, we, we have to do it for this date. And she's like, okay, that's not a problem. I'll, I'll make the arrangements and stuff like that. So then everything's fine. Um, I got an email yesterday asking for the link again. So I'm assuming that means you're gonna be on. Um, mm -hmm. But then um, I got an email like two hours before around like five uh, I was saying like, oh, uh, well, I'm not feeling well because I'm pregnant and like, I, you know, so yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't want to read people, but it, it, I suspect she went on vacation and just kind of didn't want to be on today. So yeah. So now she was asking to reschedule and I'm like, 
it's going to be up to Tyler because, you know, it's got to be fair to him too. Like I can't, we yeah. can't schedule this when we have so many guests, but yeah. 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 So that was the last I heard from, heard from her. If it would have been like yesterday or something, it would have gave me time to put something together for now. But like I said, I'm completely going off a whim here and, and just improving this entire thing. If it would have been yesterday, fine. If it would have been a week ago, fine. It's two hours before showtime. Not cool. So no, I personally don't want her back. Um, it is what it is. If you want to have her on uh, real seekers, that's cool. But I don't think I'm going to be a part of that. Um, yeah, I'm thinking the only way I would do it is like to charge a fee kind of thing. Like, cause th okay, this that's what I was thinking, but I didn't know. Oh, uh, I, I don't want to go oh. crazy with it, but we'll I've see. Been dealing with, like these, these are guests that I'm not reaching out to. They're reaching out to me to be on the show, right? So right. I'm doing them a favor, but like I've right. had like I've had like four podcasts this week. This is like my fifth one. And I've had like multiple people always with this rescheduling stuff. So I'm just kind of like fed up. Like, it, okay, if we schedule it and you miss it, you're going to pay a fee or it's gone kind of thing because, you know, you got to respect my time too. So, well, I'm glad to say at least I wasn't the only one that had that thought. Go ahead, Jamie. Tyler, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to blow our, our engagement. Uh, there's a two for one at the Piggly Wiggly. And so <laughs> <laughs> you're good, bro. I appreciate you stopping by and keeping this thing going for, for an hour. No, no, I'm so. just, I'm kidding. Well, I'm get out of here. You know what? You're not kidding. Bye. See, I've got that power, Jamie. Just know that. So whenever you want to go Piggly <laughs> know, Wiggly sir. on me, just know that. And you want to be a moderator. If you, have an if, if you have to cancel with an emergency, it's one thing. Yeah. Sorry, I was just sticking up for you, you know. <laughs> you goofy. You goofy. Troy, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm better now that I yeah. see all my friends here. It's nice to see everybody here. So yeah, it's good. Man, yeah, I, I saw or I see that you guys have been live for a little over an hour. Um, I saw that Father James was on here. I actually just yeah. recently did um, an interview with him. He kind of wanted to get my conversion story. I wish he would have stayed on a little bit longer because as soon as I joined, he like left. Um, and I kind of I'm like, you know, I don't want to be in an, in an echo chamber. But um, yeah. Yeah, no, just like Jordan said to uh, faith and works, that is kind of also something that I hold dear to my heart. And it's one of my favorite subjects. So um, anywhere in scripture, you know, I'd be willing to go to and kind of defend that position um, or just whatever you guys end up talking about, because I know it's open mic night. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I Priscilla, I'd love to have you on whenever because I never heard of Father James before. Maybe he's been in the chat. Maybe I've seen him. But other than that, I'm not familiar with him at all. And so whenever he said that he was closer to Calvinism than R.C. Sproul, and, or, or uh, let me say this, he was closer to what ta Calvin taught than R.C. Mm -hmm. Sproul, John MacArthur, guys like that. Like I said, look, I've got to have you on to explain what you mean by that. And so if you want to be a part of that conversation, or if I can get him on to do a faith and works conversation, just because I think we need another one of those, like, I would love to have you on either co-hosting or arguing for whatever you would want to do. Uh, I just love to have you back on. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, I just actually recently had met him too. He just reached out, asked me if I wanted to do it. And I'm, I, I typically don't decline, you know, I don't have any reason to. So, sure. um, yeah, but from what I know, he's an Anglican priest, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know too much of what he holds, but um, yeah, that's kind of like also I just recently met him as well. Okay, right on, right on. Yeah, I'd love to have him back and, and hopefully maybe we can make something happen. So I'll keep you in the loop on that whenever I hear from him. I'll probably reach out to him soon and see what's going on. But, but like as Priscilla just said, this is open mic, guys. So if you all want to share something this is the time for sharing in our faith unaltered family um if you've got something that you want to share please go ahead feel free to i see dell on mute dell take over for just a second i gotta run grab something to drink i will be right back though sure yeah so i, I was just gonna say um so one of the shows that i did this week uh, my favorite one was between uh, a guy named kevin non uh or kevin o'connor i don't know if you guys know of his channel and stuff um and uh caleb jackson and we were talking about mary and apparitions and the evidence for and against that so i yeah i, I think that's an interesting topic um i was there, there are, man was was he the same one who did the eucharist miracles like trying to the 
uh, debunk yeah. them or, okay. Yeah. I was, I was waiting for that second part. I'll have to go back and find it then. Yeah. It was on, uh, it's on real seekers, um, only, but yeah, like if Tyler mm -hmm. wants to upload it on faith and Alter, he can, but I actually, I asked him and he's, I think he said no. So it's on real seekers kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, it was a great show. I mean, very informative. He concentrated on specifically Catholic ones, but um, he was saying that there are certain Orthodox ones that he finds more persuasive. So since we have we have Orthodox people here, I was going to say, like, yeah, what do you guys think of mm -hmm. Aryan apparitions as evidence for Orthodoxy and stuff like that? Uh, Marian apparitions are just like visits from Mary, right? Like that's what that because because I know that there's all kinds of saints who visit people. I um not just Mary. so we Orthodox doesn't find that uncommon at all and and I would I would say though uh if if a saint visits you that's and and, and it's and it produces a miracle or some repentance then i think that is that is a uh, that is proof for at least the intercession of the saints i wouldn't say necessarily it proves orthodoxy or catholicism unless it uh, unless there's something else involved with it but yeah i've heard m many different stories of people being visited by saints um and i really is like how how can you deny it's like how can someone deny that either because it's one thing if you're visited by an angel or a de or um a demon in disguise and and they're clearly leading you to to sin or or it's just some uh material wealth or something like that but like if 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 that spirit leads you to um repentance or he healing healing can be can be either one technically but um it's like how can you or, or saving your life like i've heard some i've heard this this is one marian apparition i've heard is that there's this um aunt taking care of a child on i think mount on one of the monasteries on mount athos and she i guess she was i don't know demented or something because she pushed the child off the cliff <laughs> and he landed and um he was a lot he, he was saved by mary by the theotokos and um they kept calling out for him calling out for him and he didn't answer because apparently the theotokos put her finger over her his mouth to be quiet and then then the next day or something they they found her him and then he was like oh it it was an auntie or or um a grandma or something that i saw I, I don't know what he said it was some i think auntie was the word he used or something in whatever language it was and then they kept looking around at all the saints in the in in the church and they kept going and he said no 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 until they got to the theotokos and he said yeah that that's who who saved me um so yeah i find that a very compelling story because like if if people were to say that was a demon or something that doesn't make any sense because demons do not want to keep children alive especially if they've just been like someone tried to kill them murder them so <laughs> anyway yeah so it's kind of, for you it's kind of like based on the good fruits you can judge that it's like authentic i guess um, yeah yeah exactly okay just one i haven't fall. heard <laughs> um i haven't heard too many apparitions marian apparitions in regards to the orthodox church but i know that you know as you mentioned the catholic church definitely has a lot more um like canonized i guess uh situations but yeah i'm just i'm right now i'm unfamiliar with the marian apparitions in the orthodox church so, so i can maybe speak a little bit to that not that i stand for the orthodox 
like represent them. But um, a lot of time, the and discussions so that I've had with, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just while you're giving your answer, um, I'm also interested because accompanying Marian apparitions, there are usually like tangible art objects, like a scapular mm -hmm. that like, it's like kind of like you wear that, you're, it's your ticket to heaven. You, you can be Hitler and you're going to heaven kind of thing. Does, does orthodoxy have like special objects like that? I do like, not know. I don't think so. No, okay. no. I so mean, I we do have we do have relics, but um, relics. Well, uh, that is a complex question. It's a good question. No, they do not have. Um, what is that called in movies where you have a magic object that just makes everything work? Um, they don't have, amulets. They don't have basically, they're like yeah, amulets. amulets. Um, but when it comes to apparitions, whether that's Mary, a saint, angels, anything. Um, the recommendation or the encouragement by the priest that I've spoken with is um, treat them with extreme caution, as in don't believe that it's an angel from God, don't believe that it's a saint, don't believe that it's Mary, um, because time will tell. Like, like what has been mentioned is the fruit of it will tell whether or not it is from God or not, but to look at everything with suspicion. Um, yeah. And like you said, I'm so glad you it, said that, man. <laughs> <laughs> so that. with most apparitions, like the question about, does it lead to repentance? Every apparition from Satan, a demon, Mary, a saint, it doesn't matter who can lead to repentance. Mm -hmm. So we have mm, that's to a good point. There, that's a good point. Right. That's if, a good if point. A demon, yeah. If a demon shows up as an angel and I'm, being taught to show um to doubt that mm. i'm going to be praying <laughs> i'm going to be yeah praying, lord um what do i need to be doing right now you know and and so it it leads me to the lord so i can take a temptation from satan or a if an angel of light appears and tries to dissuade me from something that God has already shown me, this is also an opportunity re to re repent, which I think something C.S. Lewis mentioned in, um, mm. in the screw tape letters that don't push too hard because you might drive him to repentance. That's, that's the way the Orthodox church approaches these things. Yeah. So, I, I actually, yeah, really, that's, that's a good I point. love that and agree with that because the Orthodox church in general, like you said, is very, very slow to not just with the apparitions but with just any doctrine or dogma um you know the catholic church is very quick and um i don't know if you guys saw the debate between luigi and i don't remember the recent guy but his, his name but you know he pointed out that the catholic church accepted the seventh or eighth ecumenical council a year after it happened whereas the orthodox church took its time and really evaluated it because there seemed to be some issues you know um it seemed very biased and they thought of you know a re gathering i think a re reevaluation kind of to maybe we need to redo it um just given mm you know, was it a real ecumenical council? So yeah, the Orthodox church, I would say, um, is very slow to canonize, you know, um, it's Events very much like different. That. Yeah. The, the process is very much different from the Catholic church. That's, that's interesting. Um, because believe it or not, from what I've heard, like that in terms of marrying apparitions, the Catholic church's official, like the people in charge of it will not pronounce on the authenticity of marrying apparitions they'll just say well there's nothing wrong with this that that's all they'll say so like it, it's weird they're tasked to pronounce is this authentic or not but yet they won't they won't do so they'll just say well there, there's no obvious problems with this so you can believe in it but we're maybe it's wrong kind of yeah. thing um, i think that yeah. that goes back to the same idea well similar idea to the way the orthodox it's not saying that apparitions of real saints of mary of angels are impossible or never a good thing it's that satan also has some of those tools at his disposal and so everything needs to be viewed with suspicion and so taking the time to go all right what fruit is this bearing yeah right? one, one other yeah. thing i'll say before jamie and tyler come in on on it and stuff but one thing I found interesting is um, our, the vision of Our Lady of Lourdes, because um, when it comes to miracle healings, 
I have thought there was some persuasive evidence there. You know, Caleb Mm -hmm. Jackson has, has done a lot of work on that, but when it comes to the origin story of the apparition itself, dear goodness, um, the whole, the whole thing is pagan. It wasn't Mary. She, to her dying day, Bernadette said, I never saw Mary. I saw a fairy. It was a forest fairy. And she even used the, uh, that little girl there in the 1850s, that little girl there in France is like a saying for like a fairy. That's, that's how they would say it back then. So, um, and yeah, she, she, when they set up the statue of Mary, she's like, that's not who I saw. No, it was some little fairy, a little tiny thing, well, a little girl or something. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to add to that too. Like when you look at the miraculous medal, the, when it was given the revelation itself is not, you know, um, heretical or like, you know, it's, it's not bad like when you read it you're like oh wow what a beautiful story so the revelation itself is like not heretical but the origins like you had mentioned um the origins of it are kind of like heretical and like like very sketchy um because the woman her name was margaret i believe and supposedly she had like carved an m in her chest or mary told her to do something and so they don't really tell those parts of you know certain apparitions or certain things that were given um like even in regards to the rosary they it's so prevalent you know 15 promises of mary to pray with it but then at the end of the day, the Catholic Church says, but you don't have to do it, right? It's like, even the apparitions too, you don't have to accept them or believe them, but they push any good Catholic would, though. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, Jamie and Tyler, and I, I guess BJ as well, since you joined, but what what are your guys' thoughts as, as I don't know what Jamie is. Um, you know, I'm an Adventist, so... <laughs> Yeah, you guys probably don't want to hear my view. I Jamie's just, an uh, interesting uh, character, that's for sure. I, I'm a fellow Protestant. Uh, I want to hear your view as well. So yeah, my Good, view Jamie. is just simple. I, I won't push my view really hard. I'll just say, um, so my view is that uh, saints are dead until the resurrection. <laughs> so I don't. I think I believe in angels, of course, and um, I think God. I don't necessarily think people are lying when they have NDEs, but I would say. Uh, I, I, my view is that um, people are awaiting the resurrection uh, when Jesus comes back. So I, I don't, I can't accept those views, but I don't, uh, I don't necessarily think people are lying or that it's always demons or whatever, but I would just say that's what I see the Bible teaching. So I, so I, I have to believe that. Can I give a little pushback and see what your response is? Yeah. Um, so when in Hebrews, uh, I don't remember if it's 12, 12 or 10, where it says you have come to the mountain. Well, speaking to the people that are alive of just men made perfect as a present reality, that pushes back against that. Uh, Paul saying that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, there, Samuel, the story with Samuel, even though there's a lot of questions around the circumstances that led to Samuel appearing to Saul. How do you deal with those? Or uh, the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, not um, not saying anything against the idea that when Jesus walked on water, they thought they saw a ghost. No correction to that, other than it wasn't a ghost, it was Jesus. Or when in Acts, Peter... A phantasm. Yep, a phantasm, right? Um, or when Peter was captured in prison and when he shows up because the angels released him, the lady who, or the little girl, girl, young lady that opened the door said it was Peter's ghost or the people inside the church said it was Peter's ghost. So not to say that well, that's well, proof, but pushback. Or, or the transfiguration, I think is a very good point. I mean, yeah. Elijah, he... You could say Elijah, he's he he uh, was taken up into heaven, so that's maybe different. But mm-hmm. Moses, but okay. Moses was dead. Okay. So, anyways, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so my view of First uh, Corinthians or Second Corinthians five, uh, the dealing with absent from the body. I don't. I think the context is clear. He says not to be unclothed, 
and and Pretty he's waiting for this more yeah he's looking for when mortality is swallowed up in victory which rings of his teaching on when that happens at the second coming so i think he's saying i he's kind of like saying i don't want to be at work i want to be at home with my family it doesn't so i would just say his next moment is the, the coming of jesus so i think he's saying he wishes to not be immortal anymore in this body which we groan looking mm. for that house which is from heaven so he's point there's many pointers i think in the context speaking of the blessed hope which is the mm. glorious appearing of the lord jesus and so as far as hebrews i would say these are all good verses i've considered um i think that is a present reality we're looking forward to the new jerusalem in heaven um and the cloud of witnesses would be like those who who lived and died. And so there are a cloud of witnesses, sort of like uh, those who came before us that were faithful. And so, so it's in the, the present so reality the, is in what Jesus accomplished. And it's kind of like already, but not yet sort of thing. That's what I would right. point so to. So the surrounding of a great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, in context of all of the men of faith from Hebrews 11, is a concept, not a direct reality. So the well, I would say it's like if you wanted if you I would say if you want to paint them in heaven I'm I'm okay with that right okay. I would just say um it I don't think it necessitates that they're actively live and conscious same with like just like like the souls under the altar sort of thing would just mean they're they're people who have died I take that as imagery painting a, a reality that's waiting for a, for a vindication by God um and then as far as I take so imagistic. I think you're versus, talking about, yeah, could yeah, ask, it's, yeah. Um, could I ask what, what, like, I mean, it sounds like you're Protestant, but I don't want to classify you. But if you were or are, um, what group do you, what faith do you align with the most? Would you say? I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, okay. But I'm so I'm a Wesleyan Protestant. Okay. So, but, but yeah, regarding, regarding the, the Samuel, I don't think it was Samuel, obviously, I, but if, it, but the last thing I wanted to comment on was, so I believe Elijah is in heaven, literally. Um, so I think he's an exception. I also think Moses is an exception. I would argue it's not clear in the given canon, at least the Protestant canon, that Moses, uh, I would say the reason Michael was contending over the body of Moses was because he was resurrected and resurrected. So I think if the, I think the the amount of transfiguration is when Jesus right before that, you know, he says there's some standing here that not taste death until they see the son of man come in power. So I think this is a picture of the second coming and it rep Moses and Elijah are like the two witnesses, the law and the prophets, which are the word of God. Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. And yeah. so this is a picture of his second coming and, and Moses represents those who will be resurrected and Elijah represents those who are alive and remain something yep. like that. That that, that that would I would agree with that understanding in a sense of the transfiguration too. I think it does picture his second coming. I think that's the main point of the trend. I mean, transfiguration, I mean, there's so much to it, but it's for us to also be transfigured and that ultimately happens at the second coming at the second coming when we're all resurrected. Um but uh, we orthodox would say that it's Elijah represents the living and um, Moses represents the dead. But the law and the prophets, the two witnesses, those all kind of um, archetypes I would agree with. And I think most Orthodox would too. But we just would say that the saints are living in heaven and active in that. Yo, hey, BJ. Really... Good to see you, man. Never met you yeah. before in person. So it's good to see you, man. Um, um, hey, what's up? How you doing? Yeah. Right on, guys. This <laughs> is not where I expected this conversation to go, to be perfectly honest with you. I think it's good. And Troy, I was waiting on the cloud of witnesses because just to make a comment on that, and then Dell, I will answer uh, the Marian apparition thing, though I haven't done any study on Marian apparitions. Uh, there was one thing I did want to say about that. Uh, specifically in the context of angels appearing before people. Um, but witnesses to me, and I would, I think it'd be fun to do a show on this specifically because Jamie, and I don't want to like put you on the spot here. I think 
everybody else already did that. <laughs> so I don't want to go there. But let me ask you this just for clarification purposes. You said that you don't believe that the saints are conscious right now. Do you believe in soul sleep? Is, is that the Seventh-day Adventist teaching, they, just out of curiosity? yeah. We don't okay. like to call it that usually. But no, yeah. and fair enough. But, but but that's the general concept that I think us and then our audience would be familiar yeah. with. Is yeah. that right? And I, and I would love for you to nuance that later on. Like I said, I want to do an episode on this. I think it'd be fun. But I brought this up on an episode the other day, and I just want to get your thoughts on it, and then I'll turn back to the, the angel appearance that I'm going to talk about. But it seems like giving the context of Hebrews 12 – giving what came before that in Hebrews 11 with the uh, hall of faith, as we so graciously call that, I think it seems that the witnesses is that which is referring to present. So since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's referring back to the people who've already been spoken about and witnesses, the verb, or I'm sorry, the noun witnesses implies the verb to witness, right? And for me, and this is what I brought up on the live stream, it seems that that is in some way a conscious action that is being activated or active in the person that's doing the witnessing. And so for me, unless there's like a dream state, and I don't want to hammer too hard on the soul sleep because I know that's not an accurate representation, but for me, anyway, the witnessing is what gives it away that these people who, if St. Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews has in mind the previous quote-unquote chapter, since we know there's no chapter divisions in the, in the original texts, if those are the people he's talking about, it seems that the verb he uses there or the noun witnessing is the key to identify what these people are specifically doing. And to do that would imply or not directly state an active, what, an active action on their part. So I'm just curious what yeah. you think about that. So it's certainly talking about everyone who's been mentioned leading up to that. Okay. But, it, but think awesome. about this. I would, so I would just say the witnesses, I would say they have a testimony. And their testimony was their faithfulness demonstrated in what's recorded in scripture in their lives. Okay. So it's, 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 they're the examples of faithfulness of people God proved in their lives on earth. And so, and if you want to like, like I've said this before to people, like if you want to paint that imagery of those verses of them, like in heaven, I'm like, I get it like that. They're sure. in heaven in that sense to me, I would just sure. say because of other things that scripture teaches, and I, th and the consistency of scripture, I feel sure we shouldn't, I think that that's not the context is what their testimony is in their faithfulness in their lives. And we're supposed to think of the stories as recorded in scripture as that example for us. So just, and they are alive in that sense. Yeah. In, in that they're in Christ, right? So, sure. Right. Right. Sorry. So just, so just for clarification, they're not witnessing our actions, but we should be witnessing what they did as a testimony right. to their legacy. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And they're right. under the altar. They're in Christ. They're right. they're we're gonna see them at the marriage supper of the Lamb, all that. Sure, sure. They give us an example of what to strive forward to. Okay, fair enough. All right. Like I guess I don't want to do a show with uh, hey man, he says, All right, thank you. I want to get oh, I, I would love to do a show with Troy and you on that subject to dive more into the nuances and, and to flush out more stuff. But anyway, um, guys, I've got to go in 10 minutes. So I want to respond to Dell and then Dell, if you want to keep this going, you're more than welcome to, if you guys want to stay and hang out and chat a little bit, you're more than welcome to, I was prepped for a two hour show tonight. Um, and so that's what I'm going to give. Uh, and then I've got to run because I've got, uh, some stuff to do with my wife. We're going to hang out, watch a movie and then tomorrow, tomorrow. So I do want to give this announcement before everybody runs. Tomorrow, we're doing a special members-only live stream that is going to begin between 1 p.m. Eastern Time and 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So give us a chance to go get set up. This is going to be an outdoor activity. I'm being uh, very ambiguous for a reason because I don't want to give away what we're doing. I want people to tune in to see what we're doing. Um, but a members-only live stream, if you have not heard about this yet, 
Um, Faith Unaltered has opened memberships on YouTube that everybody is more than welcome to participate in if you want to. Uh, it's $2.99 a month for the low tier and $4.99 a month for the mid tier tier. I'm going to add a high tier later on. That's going to be a little bit more that you get a little bit more, but right now it's basically all the tiers get basically the same thing. The only difference that I'm going to do right now is the, the mid tier, which is the clergy. If you sign up for that $4 and 99 cents a month, and you recommend us a video to do, we are going to do that video. We get recommendations left and right, and we can't always do them. And so what I would like to do is if somebody who has signed up for the clergy for the clergy platform or the clergy tier wants to recommend us a video, that's something you don't get with the laity tier. But if you sign up for the clergy tier and you recommend us a video, then we'll do that video. Um, so kind of like a sponsorship thing. Uh, but other than that, the low tier, the high tier, is simply what y'all can afford if you would like to participate in it. It's not recommend. It's not required. It's recommended. It's not required, but you do get special perks like faith, uh, like members only live streams, members early access to videos, special shout outs, all that fun stuff. And we're doing a special members only live stream tomorrow. That's gonna be outside. So I'll leave it there. And if y'all would like to sign up, uh, click the blue join button beside the blue or the red subscribe button on our homepage and you can be in on that action if you'd like to. We've got eight members so far, so that's super exciting. Uh, and thank you all to who's ever done that. Uh, Jamie, I know that you have, and we've got a few more that I gave a shout out video to just yesterday on that. So if you'd like to be a part of that, please do. But Dale, to go back to your question and no more plugs for the rest of this video for me anyway, but to go back to your question about apparitions, the first thing that came to mind was Muhammad and Islam and hearing Troy and hearing Jordan and hearing Priscilla and hearing you and everybody else that talked about this specifically reference repentance and specifically realizing who it seems like an initial realization of who or what is appearing to you. Muhammad had it right to begin with. He told, I think it's his, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's his wife at the time. Yep. Okay. Well, well, yeah, one of his wives at the time. <laughs> he says, this is a demon, and she's the one that actually convinces him that it's not, that this is the angel Gabriel, who I believe Islam would say is the Holy, or, or Muslims would say is the Holy Spirit, which is completely wrong, but for another show, I guess at this time, but it seems like if Muhammad would have went with his gut feeling with his presupposition that, yeah, maybe angels of God wouldn't choke me to almost death. Uh, I don't see that in the Bible. I don't see that in the scriptures. I don't think we would have even had Islam to begin with, but, but more so off that topic but rather to the repentance thing, to, to recognizing who or what this is initially, I think is key to this whole idea in general. Um, I'm not saying Mary can't. Obviously, there are stories within orthodoxy that attribute that quality to her appearing before people, just as saints appear before, uh, before monks and other saints uh, who are yet living at the time. I'm not going to go out on a limb and say they can't do that um, because I've personally prayed for that to happen before. It hasn't yet, um, but just being honest with you all here. But, um, but yeah, I, I just that, that was the first thing that came into my mind, and I just wanted to share that a little bit and, and get your thoughts on that too, Dale. Um, but what, what do you think about Muhammad in that instance? Yeah, well, I mean, that, believe it or not, like I didn't say, um, I think, oh, well, if the good fruits are, are enough, that makes sense. I was just kind of clarifying what Jordan's position was, what he was saying. Right. I, I don't think, I mean, that the fact that it, you know, the Lord's apparition was said to be a fairy, I think that this disproves it. It was taken, to, it was co-opted by the Catholic Church afterward. And they said, no, 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 you saw Mary, right? You saw Mary. And 
mm. you know, hounded her until uh, she changed her mind and said, uh, maybe, I don't know. It was a lady. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, and it's the same with that. So I, uh, Muhammad comes to mind, right? I mean, a house divided. Mm. I, I don't think that, you know, God is, you know, God is uh, somehow using demons and stuff like that to create his, uh, you know, authenticate his religion or something like that. That right. That just doesn't make sense to me because a house divided against itself can't stand. So I think the closest we get to that, maybe in scripture, and and this is just off the top of my head, but lying Jacob spirit. wrestling with God. What would you say? Sorry. No, no. I thought you were going to go with the lying spirits or something. First Kings oh, no. 22, yeah. <laughs> yeah, First well, that Kings too. Yeah. But, but, but specifically, like, interacting whatever wrestling means in this situation, right? That's kind of the closest thing we get to what Muhammad experienced with Gabriel, and I think it's still a far stretch in between that with Jacob wrestling with, well, who we later know as God, um, and seeing him face to face like that, and wrestling around with him, and getting his hamstring or getting hit that that tendon or ligament in his leg uh, damaged. That seems hey, to be the closest Tyler, thing. What, but, what's, yeah, go ahead. What's the original word? I just this just came to my mind. I've never thought this. I I argue that that's a Christophany too. Um, I just yeah. wonder if what word is used for God there? Is it Elohim? <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if it's uh, Adonai I, or Elohim. I, I could look. assume. Yeah, if you I could look, look, that'd be great. I, I think in the Septuagint is Theos though. Um, off just off the top of my head, but I'd have to look to make sure. Excellent. I hope you. That's the case. <laughs> that'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But other than that, guys, um, is there anything else? Troy, it was good seeing you, brother. I love you, dude. And I've got to do more streams with you. Like, I ah, I hate that I have to go, but but I love you, dude. Jamie, Troy, BJ, it's, it's good to see you. Okay. Dale, thank you for coming. And Jordan, it's always a pleasure to have you on with us as well. Um, but, guys, I've got to run uh, and spend some quality time with my wife. And Dale, uh, Dale can, you, can you end the stream? Yeah, yeah, you can. Do you still have access? Okay, okay. Like, so, do, is anyone here? Do we have anything else to discuss, or is everyone? I think, good? Like, I don't know. I think BJ had a good question. Oh, yeah, so go. BJ is gonna. Yeah, go ahead, BJ, and then I'm gonna run. But you guys yeah, go continue. Go as long as you want to, and enjoy. So I love you all, and I'll see you guys hopefully tomorrow. Good so. to see you, Tyler. All right, see ya. Godspeed. Yeah. Love you. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so unmute. Yeah. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, can y'all hear me well? Yep. You're coming yeah. through. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, to change everything completely, except we're still talking about Christianity in the Bible, of course. Um, but to change complete subject. So uh, lately, I was at, I was at, I work at my church, and sometimes there's a bunch of people there, and I'll um, listen to uh, stuff on my phone. So I was listening to, like, the songs. I'm um, walking around like cleaning and stuff, and then I could just pause it, you know, when someone needs my attention. Um, that's too much information, probably. So I'm listening to the Psalms off and on again, and I'm hearing like certain things. Like uh, for some reason, certain things are coming to mind, like uh, beating up enemies, and and I'm strong and have a sword, and I can uh, leap over walls and. Uh, uh, stuff like that. Now, now I remembered other stuff that was said, of course, you know, important stuff. But I was thinking, man, it's uh, um, I've read the Psalms like I don't know, twenty times probably. But uh, uh, for some reason, right now, that's coming to me. Well, then I was like, hey, I'll listen to Isaiah. So I was listening to Isaiah, and I just kept hearing about how what kept coming to mind for some reason, I don't know why. Was uh, God's going to destroy these people? He's going to wreck them. He's going to make them swim in their dung. And he's going to uh, uh, kill people and death and destruction. It's all going to be annihilated. Everything. And I'm like, goodness gracious. So Jesus quoted Isaiah quite often, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, so did Paul. But I don't recall Jesus or Paul quoting those parts. I uh, talked about lambs led to the slaughter at one point, I guess. Um, but I was just confused. I was like, wow, I'm trying to listen to this stuff so I can like get in the mindset of, say, what Jesus or Peter or Paul or James would have been in because they heard the uh, Old Testament all the time. That's all they, they, you know, all the time. Well, then I'm starting to listen to it. 
this 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 go around and suddenly i'm like man i'm just like hearing all this crazy stuff um um what would y'all what would y'all say to that yeah i'm just yeah yeah what would y'all say do you mind Very take a go at it question. um I think that there is some New Testament language that is very similar to that, where Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword, and that a man's enemies will be those of his household, and I will set the heart of the father against a son and a son against a father. Okay, so there's that, more that language is like that. That is already super helpful. Yep. Yeah. Um, Paul talks about that our our warfare and our weapons are not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers and forces and darkness. It's in Ephesians, um, whole armor of God. So the military language continues in the new Testament. And you see that in revelation as well. Um, and I understand if revelation is very difficult to get anything out of, uh, a few different people have done studies that every single verse in revelation has three references to the old Testament. So if you don't have a command of the old Testament, revelation is going to be a closed book to you. Um, so what I would say is that there is a thread through all of Scripture, specifically starting in the Genesis 3 narrative of the fall, where the seed of the serpent is set against the seed of the woman, and there is warfare continually through Scriptures. So Genesis 6, the giants, and most of Joshua is gigantomachy, war against giants. And if you take the idea that the Raphaim, the the giant kings like Og and Sion, which is some of the Psalms that you've been reading, um, are defeated Raphaim, but it also talks about the Raphaim rising at the end. And that's where we get, there's one way of reading that is that's where you get demons in the New Testament. Where do they show up from? Where, what are they, where are they from? Right. Um, they're not just fallen angels, although you could define angels as fallen, uh, fallen angels as demons, but that these are the, disembodied spirits of the Raphaim kings. Okay, so our warfare continues. It's just our warfare is continuing against the spiritual giants, the spiritual tyrants that enslave us. And so when you read the psalm that says, happy is the one that dashes your children against the stone, speaking of Babylon, all right, you're talking about a tyrant king that is now a spiritual a spiritual entity influencing us to sin, and the offspring of him is our passions and sin. So yes, Joyce is the one that overcomes his passions and sins. Right now, that's an analogical, analogical reading, if that's the right way of saying it. Um, but it's helpful. Yeah, yeah, I've I've heard that before. I recall uh, Peter Kreef, um talking about that, um, about you know. Um, Early church fathers, I think he said, a lot of them would read the um, Old Testament, like 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 beating up their enemies as a, uh, you know, going against demons and such. It's it's because they're looking at it through the lens of Christ. Through the lens of Christ. Right. So I've got two books that I recommend. Example. It's oh sorry, Christ. Oh, yeah, key. yeah. Go for it. Uh, I would recommend this book, The Christ Key, which is learning to read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. It's really helpful. And then when you're talking about dealing with the violence in the Old Testament and where does that come from, this is a good one too. God is a Man of War by Stephen DeYoung. So, the God of Sabaoth? Uh, yep, that's a good one. Um, so that's what I would recommend if you're wrestling with that. But I'll, I'll digress now. What, what was the other comments? I was just going to say, the way I kind of parse this out partially is to say, well, this Jesus is this God. What are we going to do with this? Well, they wanted him to, to bring the kingdom now. And it seems like he came to deal with the heart of man, uh, which is a necessary prerequisite to the kingdom coming. And so is what first came to mind when you brought this up was how to deal with this is that I think God is going to destroy wickedness and evil. And, but he's, he wants to save humans because they're all image bearers. And so I think of like when Jesus gets up in Luke three and he reads from the prophet Isaiah and he says, um, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I think the poor are those who are recognized that they're, they're, they're hopeless in sin, but that God wants to re redeem them. So he's bringing hope to these people. And so he sent me to, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. I think those are, captives to the devil and they're in their not being 
close to God like they can be and will be now in Christ. And recovery of sight to the blind, it's also literal um, healing of people. That's There doesn't seem to be much of a separation between demonic activity and and things that are bad in the world, right? Like physical ailments, et cetera. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it to the attendant and sat down. He said, you know, today the scripture is fulfilled. And if you go to Isaiah 61, verse 2, it says, to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord, comma, and he doesn't read the next part of the sentence, and the day of vengeance of our God. And so I think yeah. that's telling of yeah. this. Um, God will judge. It's just he wants to save first and save people uh, yeah. to the uttermost. Yeah, I think both of you guys have great points then that are it's connected to both like it's both a spiritual and physical warfare i mean i mean well what i mean by physical is that god's the judge he's going to judge his enemies physically like destroy them all like when christ returns it's not going to be the same as when he came first time he's going to come with eyes of fire and in all of his glory and to destroy wickedness and evil and sin in this world. And that means people too, the people who who rise up against him. I mean, I mean, like Troy was saying, there is this arch but like archetype type of like the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman being um Israel and the church of the seed of the woman and, and ultimately the seed in itself is Christ and then the seed of the serpent it basically antichrist and hit all of his but in antichrist doesn't just mean this is the thing is antichrist doesn't just mean the one person who's going to rule the you know in the future antichrist means all who rise up against Christ who don't confess that Jesus is come in the flesh and all that and and even even uh john says there's been many antichrists throughout this time and as troy was saying and my friend has been telling me about there's these kings throughout the old testament and throughout the new testament too and throughout history who are like giants they're like nephilim nephilim is a mixture of a uh, fallen angel and a human it's an improper balance of heaven and earth and it's a and it's a um a chaotic type which grows into sin and, and sin and so you have king of og and sihon which are are, are literally destroyed and killed in, in the exodus story and you see this throughout the psalms him singing about this and singing about god's victories over death and over sin and and really these enemies he's talking about really they are demons demonic forces in people in in kings and in um and, and you it continues to and uh uh to um what haman and antiochus and and herod and and uh nero and continues to throughout history even now so um i, I mean god will judge his enemies no matter what throughout time and he's going to judge these kings or these people who are influenced by demonic forces throughout the ages but ultimately the day of judgment when christ returns he will wipe out all of that enemy all of the enemies ultimately satan and throw them in the lake of fire but even even before that even on his resurrection even him descending into hades and and breaking down the wall or you know triumphing over death and and sin and satan he's he's triumph he's showing his victory and his power in his uh the resurrection of the human nature and it's kind of a reverse of genesis 3 and it's a reverse of the the fall and now it's now human humanity is raised up and so that's why all are going to be resurrected on the end at the end and so yeah i would just say like these things that you're hearing in in psalms and in isaiah which are very similar because they're all 
have messianic prophecies in it pointing to Christ and pointing to his victory over death and over sin. And so usually most Psalms, I mean, I, I, I read a, I try to read a Psalm or sing a Psalm every day. And it's usually something about Christ's victory or God's victory and salvation and, or praise and praise. And it's usually over sin or enemies there's all this talk about enemies in in psalms enemies 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 i will defeat my enemies i'll do this and, and sometimes it's it's he's also not saying um that i'm doing it myself but christ is doing it and 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 david is even an archetype of christ so you see that he's defeating the enemies defeating um sin and and even in his own sin he has repentance and that repentance points to Christ and to this victory over sin and death and um and a change of nature and a change of um an example Isaiah um not Isaiah Psalm 68 you read through this and it's this big huge like it's a very it's one of the most beautiful psalms in my opinion and it's the first three it says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let them who hate him flee before him. And let them, let those sinners perish, but the righteous be glad. And that verse, first three songs is sung, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's sung during Holy Week or I, I, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. It's sung, sung on Pascha, I think, which is, is Christ sent, making the enemies flee. And it's this kind of, exorcism of sorts or like casting out of demons and throughout it, it even talks about he descended and ascended on high to let uh captivity captive and give gifts to men in the holy spirit and all that so it's just so prophetic about christ and about his judgment about his the resurrection about all the things of the faith really is in there over sin triumph over sin and death so yeah um i think what i think another difficulty i might have um and y'all might just tell me well then you're in the wrong tradition um i speak of everybody saying you know i'm i'm orthodox adventist this and that i'm one of those uh, uh like uh, um calvary chapel types almost uh, I don't, uh, don't believe in the crazy eschatology um, stuff, uh, uh, but at Calvary Chapel types, and I'm, I'm very much like, I like the idea, obviously Christ is in the Old Testament. Obviously there's stuff that goes from the new to the old or that alludes to it, you know. Um, but then there's a lot of stuff that doesn't. Mm. And I hear like, hey, we can take this psalm and see Jesus in it. And I say, okay. Show me the scripture for that. Oh, okay. well, you can just kind of see it from illusions and from uh, archetypes. And I'm like, I agree I'm, you can, but it's difficult for me to accept that because then, like, if the if, if I don't have, like, direct revelation from God, then I have um, potentially direct revelation through Christians, obviously. God speaks through us. But if, like, say, three Christians come up with three different things and they all sound good, it's like, am I supposed to believe all of them? What if they're contradictory? I'm not sure. I, so it's hard for me to take the – I'm almost done. Sorry. No, that's good. It's hard that's, for me to take the very, I'm, I'm uh, the very physical language of, like, like killing people with swords and then not see that in the New Testament said, well, that means we, we can relate that to demons hmm. rather directly. I almost okay. – and it might just be my mindset then in that. that there is there is a jump to make so it's not that's not um i'm not dismissing that difficulty jesus said you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life but they speak of me right so there is a scripture from christ's own words that says all of scripture speaks of him so um with that in mind the christ key that's the book i recommended by chad bird um is teaching us the tools or helps teach the tools on how to see Christ on every page. So that being said, you're right. There is direct 
physical language of swords and eating babies and very grotesque and dark violence in the Old Testament. Um, and my attempt is not to excuse any of that. It is difficult. We live in a different world than that world. Um, much different world. Not, not many of us have seen combat. Not many of us have seen death occur um, in violent ways. So we don't have the experience to judge it because we don't live in a barbarian world anymore. So that being said, I think that the type of books the literary genre of many books. Joshua, for one, is a um, conquest epic, which is a type of genre that many kings in during the time that Joshua would have been written had been writing. Um, the pharaohs had uh, conquest epics where they came in, wiped out an entire nation, didn't lose a single soul, even though they were outnumbered 10 to one. It's, it's a genre back then to say, look how mighty our gods are. So is asking whether or not Joshua is factual and historical is different than asking whether or not Joshua has meaning, right? And the meaning and every single person, every single people group that Joshua was said, you need to wipe out, completely dedicate them to destruction. Every man, woman, child, and animal, all of those were giant clans, every single one of them, right? Whereas the people like the Moabites and some of the others, they were like, look, um, they performed gigantomachy and I gave them this land. You're not even allowed to set a foot on their land. Right, the offspring, uh, the Edomites, offspring of um, Esau, um, the Moabites, the offspring of uh, Lot. Right, you're not even allowed to be on their property because they went there and they already fought their giants. Now it's your turn, right, for the rest of Canaan. So recognizing that it's a different type of genre than historical, factual writing that we would see today, like if somebody was covering the Civil War or covering World War II, it's a different genre. And to have the lenses, a modern lens, when reading scriptures is going to twist and torment scriptures into something that wasn't intended to be in the first place. That would be my encouragement. And it is a difficult yeah. thing to wrestle with. Um, um, what you're saying, uh, I've, I've been listening to the Lord of Spears podcast. Um, and I listened to two of the lectures, uh, God is a Man of War, mm -hmm. with Father, Father Stephen. Um, yep. Then I That's listened funny. to some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He did like uh, on 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 some website of uh, website he has or used to have. He had uh, three lectures, like an hour hour and a half long each lecture, something like that. They're really good. Um, listening to more stuff. Uh, I don't want to just say Michael Heiser. Oh, and that's it. But but more stuff like that to get back in that time period. Um, I've been understanding all that better. So what you're saying is sounding very familiar. So if anybody in the audience is like. What in the world is Troy talking about? You know, go go look up stuff. Uh, you, you know, you know, uh, Michael Heiser or uh, Lord of Spirits podcast talked about it. Of course, it's a lot of listening. But I, yeah, I'm not um, the genius behind those uh, ideas. What you just <laughs> is where I got a lot of that. Too. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, <laughs> and they stand on the shoulders of giants. Not that kind of giant. Though. Yeah, right. right. Uh, um, I DJ, just, I just oh, sorry. Wish, yeah, can I just mention really quick? Just um, I I've been reading a book on my channel called In prophetic interpretation and there's i i like calvary chapel i have a lot of agreements with them i would just say um the thing i would disagree with i think maybe they want to this is a hermeneutical decision right like how how literal do you want to take uh passages about the day of the lord from the old testament and apply it only to israel if you go that view i think it makes it harder but there's also and then of course that's contrasted with an allegorical interpretation but i think the new testament shows us that Jesus and the apostles apply Old Testament prophecy and give us the hermeneutic of a typological kind. And so that would be my uh, thing to, to yeah. just say something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. R real quick, real quick. And um, maybe Dale could say something or Jordan. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm you know, uh, uh, 
when I say Calvary Chapel type, I don't mean uh, uh, taking it literally in that way. I mean more like um, if if the if the Bible says they killed all these people and it means Gigantomachy, and I learned that oh, then that's the literal interpretation, you know. Um, but but more like uh, if I don't see in the text, uh, like 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 Troy said, there is a jump. It's hard for me to um, accept like like oh, I love all the stuff that Jesus says about you know I said they are gods, and I can be like yeah let's talk about that one. And then somebody says oh well Jesus was also the rock in the wilderness. I'm like well Paul mentions that, and then somebody's you know Jesus lifted up on the pole. Paul mentions that. But then they mentioned something, say, uh, the sacrifice of Isaac was like Jesus. And I'm like, well, it sounds really good. And there's a lot of symbolic language I can see. But it would have been really cool if an apostle specific or Jesus specifically and explicitly laid it out. Mm. You know, so I can I can see the symbolism and such. I guess I'm, I'm not trying to be skeptical. That, that's what I meant, though, by uh, Calvary Chapel. Like, um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Mm. I've, I've been struggling with the same stuff. Sorry, Dale. Go ahead. Sorry, Dale. Please. No, no, no worries. No, yeah, go I, for it. Go for it, Dale. Um, well, so this is, I think, your your fourth time, maybe third or third or fourth time coming on, third time coming on the show with, with the same issue kind of thing. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to, like, really listen to, like, obviously what we're saying is not helping or solving the thing so like could you maybe like what what is the issue the direct issue that you're struggling with is it a, a morality issue is it an issue of interpretation like how do we interpret this the, yeah 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 the i don't recall what i talked about the first time but the second time i did ask about um about pacifism type stuff yeah. and then i i typed in the comments and y'all y'all replied a little bit you know back to me i didn't mean to make that a big issue um this is different i was more thinking i listened to isaiah to hopefully get more like 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 so when i come to read the new testament i have that in mind but for some reason all i hear is all the stuff that would like drive one nuts for some reason i wasn't hearing any of the i wasn't remembering recalling any of the like uh, any, any other yeah. stuff, any other topics. I don't want to go and say, well, maybe that's demons or something. I mean, could be, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm not no, I mean, that, that's that, a good... that was more my, that was more my thing. Like when I meditate on the scriptures, I was just wondering why in the world was that sticking in my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's more, it's more of a personal I, question. I, guess. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a good, um, a good point. I mean, in a sense that you want to understand what the apostles and Christ had in mind when they were reading the Old Testament. Um, well, I mean, just to be kind of blunt and honest, like most of a lot of the Old Testament throughout it has a lot of violence in it, like just plain out, like, um, not. And, it, and like Troy was saying, we don't live in that kind of necessarily that kind of society, or I would say it's now fantasized in, in, in video games and movies now. But um, that's a different sort of different subject. But yeah, I would say, yeah, a lot of Old Testament is violent and it has um, these. So, so maybe so maybe it's not very surprising. No, that yeah, that I'm re recalling all of that. Yeah, especially that makes especially yeah. especially the um, especially the books you chose. You chose Psalms <laughs> and, <laughs> and and Isaiah. If you would have done like if you would have done like Proverbs, maybe. Oh, okay. You well, you, I pro you probably still wouldn't necessarily hear the New Testament, but you would hear like, oh, wisdom for daily life or something, you know, but. You chose like a prophetic book and a wisdom, also prophetic book, basically so, the Psalms, which are songs and and psalters, and it's and a lot of a lot of songs and and uh, poetry back then, which had to do with, with 
both of those are very poetic books. Um, and a lot of poetry back then in the ancient Near East had to do with victory over enemies. And, and like Troy was saying, there was epics like 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 Joshua is basically a conquest epic. Um, and it has history to it, obviously, but um, there's there's very much a um, there's very much a like I I don't even know how to how to say it. Like if you read if you read the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh or some of these older um, myths, um, you'll understand in a sense that they they have this hero type and in the pagans hero types were these giants whereas our hero is christ so in a sense that is why we also we're talking we speak in this kind of allegorical or um not even fully allegorical because it is it's physical too because christ does destroy his enemies physically and he did that through literally through Israel, through killing people who were doing pagan sacrifices and had giants who were doing disgusting and horrible things that are kind of hidden today or, or hidden in like abortion or s certain things. Um, so it's like, yeah, I guess. I guess another way of approaching it is, are you looking at those passages and going, what instructions can I get from those for me today? Or is it, I don't think that there should be violence in a thing that's represented as the word of God or scripture. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hard part. I do. I've discovered, uh, I like Dell was like, Hey, this is like the umpteenth time you brought this up and he's right. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking, it wasn't chastised. I was, I'm trying to like, because yeah, I yeah. Clarification. Solve your problem. So, like, I, I want yeah. to. Yeah. What is it? Like, what? Yeah. I didn't even mean to bring it up again necessarily. And, that, and then I was like, wait, that's exactly what it is. No, right. that, that's totally fine. Like this is like Troy said. My my answer. If, if you're if you're, um, and this uh, this was independently, but it's I see Troy in the chat actually confirms it as well. But I, I swear I was going to say this without seeing that that. If your question is like, well, why is this sticking out to me so much? I, I do think in my experience, when there's a pressing issue that keeps bugging me, and if I keep trying to put it to the side, um, it, it never goes away or, or it'll get worse. So mm -hmm. I've tr or tried to take advantage of those opportunities to find let's let's hunker down and get into it kind of thing. Right. And, you know, every, everyone here will know, like, you know, the Sola Scriptura issue with, with the Orthodox, for example, right? With my experience with Jay Dyer. Okay, so I, I didn't want I didn't want to think about it for a while and I, I took a break, but it was it was still there. Like, okay, I, I need to get to the bottom of this uh, Orthodox claim about tradition versus Sola Scriptura. And sure enough, I did kind of thing. And it it solved the issue kind of thing for me when I was able to like deal with it head on. So I think if, if your question is like, why, why does God keep pressing this as an issue for me over and over again? I think it's maybe he wants you to like, just deal with it head on like you're doing. Like, and mm -hmm. yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's one reason I, I, I saw the, the open mic and I was like, Hey, I, oh man, <laughs> I was like, Hey, I love those things. Um, you know? And then I thought this question is like, Hey, I could ask about this because it's been on my mind. So yeah, um, definitely this has been very helpful. That's so. good. I think sometimes we look for shortcuts and, you know, the scriptures say study to show thyself approved work unto Christ Jesus, rightly handling the word of truth. So um, not to discourage you going to as many open nights as po open mics as possible, to ask the same question at various places to find the one answer that you like, it may just take work on your part to go and study, to dig deep, like Dale is saying, and get into it yourself and actually see what scholars and theologians have said across the centuries, many 
you know, 20 centuries of material to draw from, which is an, practically an endless supply, functionally an infinite supply of information. Get to it. And, yeah. and maybe, you'll, maybe you'll have an insight that none of our answers have been able to give you because you're specifically supposed to study this yourself and you're going to get an insight that we don't have. So one of another thought that I want to encourage you with um, is that Christ's defeat of his enemy is enemies is their death. And what is the entry into, into being a Christian is baptism, our death. So it's death or death recognize that that that's <laughs> yes. true today right it's either i reckon myself dead with christ and join him on the other side of death through baptism or i go through death myself so recognize the rules of the old testament are the same and they're different um continuities and discontinuities the the only people the only people just about at my church uh, that I have to talk about this. I'm in a Sunday school, and they're all like, most of them are parents with 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 kids that are like, you know, in elementary school, maybe junior high. And then I do a Bible study with ladies that are like in their 70s. And if I'm like, hey, so what do y'all think about? I mean, we talk about it, but you get all sorts of odd um, Methodist. Um, like, oh, we don't want to think about that. And I'm like, but I do. I need to. So this is this has actually been a help. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. I, I one time I um one time I was reading the old testament uh I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Not fifteen. We weren't my, me and my wife got married about fifteen years ago. So seventeen. Yeah, seventeen. Anyway, so I'm in, I'm I'm in our room. I'm reading through Isaiah, and I was like, I was like, man, all I all I see are people doing bad stuff, evil stuff, and you know, God's angry, and and why does he? And my wife said, you need to read more of the New Testament. Like, yeah. So then, so maybe it's been a longer journey than I thought, because I've always had a a problem with like seeing like violence and god being violent I've, it's always bothered me but i've been like well it doesn't matter because it's in the bible and he's god he redeems it he knows what he's doing but yeah i guess it's still there so um so this has been this has been enlightening tonight yeah. sounds yeah. good yeah it's uh all right cool so i am i am seeing uh some people have to go the kids are getting restless and that sort of thing so <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone's had his term. Uh, again, I came in an hour late and that sort of thing. But I want to thank everyone for, for coming on. Um, I'm happy, uh, Jordan and Jamie, I'm happy to, to do shows with you guys uh, anytime. Just send me uh, an email and we can hook it up that way. Um, but yeah, uh, BJ, like like I said, um, I was not I was never scolding you for bringing up the same, asking the same question. Because I was the same way when I was doing my religious research. I would go over issues at least three times. So I'm sure to people like Gary Habermas and them, it would seem like I was asking the same question or I would ask the same question to different people to, to hear what their answers were and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my intention there was just to kind of like, okay, I, I don't think we're, we're hitting the spot for it. So I wanted, what, what exactly is your issue to, to give you a better answer type thing. So that's what I was doing there. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much for for coming on, guys, and uh, have a um, yeah. Tyler's doing his uh, his secret little members only group, so uh, you know, ooh, I'm a host, but I'm not a member, so I I won't be there. Uh, but <laughs> no, have have fun with whatever he's doing um, outside, and uh, yeah, next week. Um, so I think it will be a joint show. I'm not 100 percent sure whether Tyler wants it on Faith and Altar, but we're doing a show on near-death experiences with experts, by skeptics this time. So Keith Augustine, uh, Michael Seduth, and um, Stephen Brody, who are um, experts, but they approach it from a non-Christian perspective. So that'll be on Friday the 16th. And uh, Otherwise, yeah, um, I, on my show, Real Seekers, I will be having uh, Phil Bear, hopefully will be coming on to discuss my debates with the Roman Catholic, Dr. Louis Dizon on 
baptismal regeneration and uh, the Eucharist is transubstantiation true. So uh, look out for that. Um, does anyone, anyone else have anything on their podcast they want to announce? Or Yeah, I want you guys to come visit me and talk to me when you can, and I'll promote your channel too. Yeah. But uh, thanks for having me. So, yeah. So. Yeah, Jordan. yeah, I'd like to come on both of you guys, Real Seeker and Jamie's channel. Um, my channel, though, I I just I don't I haven't posted anything on it in a long time. I, I, I do have a channel, but it's kind of a uh, cringe. But anyways, I yeah, would nice. still like to come on <laughs> to other yeah, people's welcome. channels. Yeah, you're welcome on my channel anytime. Any specific topics you'd want to do or? Yeah, well, I'm thinking of one um, right now, and I don't know if I want to ask um, uh, Faith on Alter to do it, or you, or whoever, but something along the lines of, like, culture and Christianity, like, something, I, I'm trying to work out the details, but, like, how culture and Christianity fit together, different cultures and around the world and stuff. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, let me know. Uh, if, if I'm chosen, if I make the cut, you're welcome on. Otherwise, I'm sure Faith and Alter will have you on. So, cool. Okay. All right. All right. So, thank you, everybody, and have a great week. You too. Bye. All right. I'm hitting the red button.